Yes, okay. All right. Let's make sure everyone's um, speakers are off. Okay. There's a speaker. Got it. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order. Apologies for the delay. Um, working through some of our uh, technical uh, challenges, but we're we're there. So let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, I want to welcome all the NAC members um, who are participating, as well as guests uh, to this uh, to this meeting. Uh, note, uh, based as you can already see, this is a hybrid meeting. Uh, so all the NAC members in the room are going to be using their computers. Uh, and even if you're in the room, whether you're in the room or, or remote, uh, go ahead and use the computer raise hand function to, uh, to comment. After your comment, go ahead and lower, lower your hand um, on the Zoom uh, raise lower hand function once you've completed your comment. Um, you can also, for folks who are, are looking on video, you can change your video settings so you can view all the members and the speakers participating in the meeting um, by going in through the video settings. Um, so you should be able to, to see it. I think it's 49 or 50 people at a time. Um, and you can scroll through that as well. So you should be able to see everyone. Uh, th this event is being recorded and will be posted to ARC's website once available. Also note there is closed captioning available for the meeting. If you do need closed captioning, uh, click the icon at the bottom of the, of the Zoom screen. There will be a public comment uh, later on uh, during the meeting. If any members of the public would like to make public comments, please uh, email National Advisory Council at hrq.hhs.gov by no later than 1.30 p.m. today, Eastern time. All right, with that, let's, uh, let's do quick uh, introductions uh, for the NEC members. I'll ask each of you to uh, introduce yourselves um, individually, kind of name, rank, serial number as we go around the room. I'll start on my right and then I'll jump onto the uh, the NAC members that are on Zoom. Uh, that'll give them time to get promoted um, to, uh, to be participants in the meeting. So starting with Caroline. Good morning, everyone. Caroline Carney, Chief Medical Officer of Magellan Health. Jaji Zhang, Dean and Professor at the UT House Houston School of Biomedical Informatics, NEC member. Good morning, everyone. Gina Reyes, Director for Clinical Transformation and Quality at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Jersey. Uh, Andrew Auerbach, a Professor of Medicine at UCSF and the NAC member. Hi, Kathy Ivory, Associate Nurse Executive at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, NAC member. Neil Goldfarb, President and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Business Coalition on Health. Krista Hughes, I'm the founder and CEO of Hughes Advocacy, and I'm a NAC member. Hi, I'm Melinda Bunton. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Health Policy at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, and I will be relogging back into the Zoom. Good morning, Saf Bitan, Executive Director, Ariadne Labs, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Brigham Women's Hospital. Patrick Romano, Professor of General Internal Medicine and General Pediatrics at UC Davis uh, School of Medicine and UC Davis Health in Sacramento, California, and here at my last NAC meeting. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Komal Bajaj, Chief Quality Officer for New York City Health and Hospitals, Jacoby and NCB in the Bronx, New York, and Professor of OBGYN at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, NAC member. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll introduce you, <laughs> Director. Uh, uh, and I, I actually didn't introduce myself, Imanda Robinson. I'm the Chief uh, Digital Officer at Moffitt Cancer Center and Chair of the NAC. I'm looking on the promoted folks in terms of NAC members, though, um, and folks who are remote. Uh, so far, I see Mireille. Hi, yeah, I'm Mireille Jacobson. I'm a professor at the Davis School of Gerontology at the University of Southern California and the Schaefer Center for Health Policy and Economics. 
Great. I thought I saw David as well. Yes, I'm David Schmitz. I'm a NAC member and professor and department chair at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Great. Any other uh, NAC members that are remote and have been promoted to be able to speak? No, I don't. I don't even see Kanan. Okay, well, if Kanan's on, go ahead. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Hi, good morning, uh, Kanan Ramar, um, a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in the division of uh, pulmonary and critical care medicine, and serve as a patient safety officer for Mayo Clinic. Great. Um, now, uh, ex officio members, any other name in the room? No, okay. Um, I thought I saw Sherry on, on um, online there. I am indeed. Hi, Sherry Ling, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, uh, CMS. Over. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> any other? Oh, Susan's on. Um, Susan, go introduce, please. Yes, hi. Um, Susan Edgman Levitan, a NAC member, and I'm the executive director of the John D. Stokel Center for Primary Care Innovation at Mass General Hospital. And this is also my last meeting. I'm going to get to you guys. I'm sorry. Henry's on. Any other any other NAC members that have been promoted um, up so they can speak that I missed or um, ex officio members? All right. Uh, as as a couple of the members noted, there are uh, several of our of our NAC that are uh, here for their last meeting. So that's Asaf and uh, Melinda and Susan and Omar and Mai. Patrick and Youngling, uh, I, I'm not going to ask you all to say anything right now, but I reserve the right <laughs> <laughs> to ask you all to to comment on your time um, on the NAC um, by meetings end. So just keep that in mind. Um, let's see if there's anything else. All right, so we can. I think we can go right into into business, uh, except I think Henry's coming on. Let me just hold and see if we can get Henry on first to do a quick intro. All right, Henry, I think I see you. Go ahead, go ahead and uh, do a quick intro. Hi, everyone. I'm Henry Ting. Um, I'm the uh, Chief Health and Wellbeing Officer at Delta Airlines and Professor Meredith from Mayo Clinic and Adjunct Professor at Emory. Thank you. Okay, I think we can jump into business now. So the first order of business is approval of the minutes. So are there any changes or edits uh, that, that folks want to mention in terms of the draft minutes from the July 21st meeting? Patrick. Um, yes, I just, I sent an email with a suggested clarification um, with respect to some of my comments from the July meeting, just to clarify, um, Dr. Romano recognized the benefits of providing provide private equity investment and working toward results, but wondered about the provider side. Um, I think what was meant was provider behavior. Captured, thank you. Any other changes or edits? Okay, so with incorporating that edit, uh, do I hear a motion to approve? I've got three hands. You guys can just speak up. <laughs> uh, uh, it's been moved. Any seconds? Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. I've got hands Aye. raised inside. Um, anyone opposed? All right, that motion carries the minutes have been approved with the edits as noted. Let's uh, take a minute to walk through the agenda for today. So uh, it's for the, for the public's knowledge, uh, the NAC members did 
do an education session earlier this morning, learning a bit about uh, PCOR, PCORI, and the PCOR Trust Fund. Um, uh, we are now uh, walk, walking, marketing through, uh, you know, the, the call to order and so forth. So that's, that's our current timing. We'll have our director give some highlights. We'll spend some time on uh, patient safety and, and recommendations around recommitting to advancing patient safety. A very brief break, and then we will spend a good chunk of time talking about the PCOR Trust Fund um, and the SNAC uh, related to that, uh, the subcommittee of the National Advisory Council uh, related to the SNAC. We have some public comment, and uh, we'll wrap up from there. So that's the agenda for today. With that, let's go to Dr. Bob and, um, and the uh, director's highlights. Great, thanks very much. And uh, uh, it's, it's not farewell, it's until we see again. Uh, so for those of you who are leaving NAC, and, and as many people have learned uh, throughout my career, um, as I used to say uh, to the graduate students, once, my, once I have my teeth into you, you never get away. So uh, I'll be calling on you anyway, even though you're not joining us on a regular basis for the, for the meeting. Uh, please do expect phone calls or emails from me uh, to keep you involved in what we're doing. So first of all, thank you. Thank you very much and uh, for your service uh, to ARC. And um, I look forward to our continued uh, interactions. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, first of all, I just want to bring you up to date with a few changes that have gone on at, uh, at ARC uh, with regard to our, our leadership structure. Uh, in, an, in an effort to um, sort of streamline the way we're operating and to re-examine how we position ourselves for the future, uh, I've made a couple of changes. Uh, David Myers uh, is now our deputy director still, but our deputy director with a particular focus on policy and strategic initiatives um, and investments. Um, Mammoth Pancholi is now our principal deputy and she's helping uh, with our focus on making our programs and operations more streamlined and more efficient. Uh, Arlene uh, Beerman has um, come into the director's office uh, to help with a particular uh, issue that, that I think ARC has uh, long ignored and actually many of us have long ignored and that is the the aging of our society and what that means for the demands for services. So Arlene, as you may know, is a, a gerontologist and uh, a geriatrics specialist. So um, she's gonna help us as our chief strategy officer, begin to think about how we uh, structure ourselves so we can begin to address the real concerns, some of which you'll see in the highlights of our intramural work, focusing on care for, on aging populations. So uh, there's lots of debate about what you call it, whether it's healthy aging, whether it's active aging, whether it's um, something else, but a recognition that many people who come to the clinic come to the clinic with not one problem, but come usually with multiple chronic conditions or chronic issues that need to be addressed. And yet much of our uh, clinical protocols are still on a disease by disease basis. And so getting a handle on that, trying to understand how we ought to reorganize our, our care and services um, is part of um, Dr. Mirvin's uh, agenda here. And uh, as a result, uh, our Center for Evidence uh, and Practice Improvement uh, has as an acting director, Tess Miller, who had previously been uh, the deputy director under Arlene uh, for that center. So I think we have some continuity and we have some freedom of uh, thinking and hopefully we're gonna be doing a lot more strategic thinking about how we move ARC to address uh, the problems that we anticipate over the course of the next 10 to 15 years and not just the issues that we're dealing with today. So um, I wanna thank them for taking on these new challenges and uh, for assisting me in thinking about how to bring those to you because I need your advice and your support uh, for how we actually go about structuring ourselves for the future. Next slide, please. Uh, 
But one of the, one of the things I wanted to do today, uh, you, you may have realized that each of the NAC meetings, I'm trying to highlight some of the work that we do at NAC, uh, I mean, that we do at ARC <laughs> for the NAC. And uh, what I'd like to do today is, is to highlight some of the intramural research that goes on here at NAC. Last time we looked at our extramural um, uh, contributions. Uh, but we have some wonderful analysts in, 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 our, in ARC uh, and uh, wonderful researchers who have really begun to address some of the issues that are affecting our society and our healthcare systems. Um, I'll draw your attention to the second of, of, of these studies that are highlighted there, looking at the closure of independent and multi-hospital uh, multi affiliated rural hospitals. As many of you know, rural hospitals are in dire straits today. Um, there are about uh, 10 states in which there are more than five uh, rural hospitals that are on the verge of closing. So that means a lot of people are being left without a center for the kinds of care that they need and the kinds of uh, extra effort that's required for them to, to receive the services that they're looking for that they need. And uh, I'm glad to know that we have people who can talk about that here as well. But uh, one of the things that's, uh, that was most intriguing to me uh, with this particular study was the fact that, uh, you know, the, those hospitals that were in distress in 2007, this was kind of a long, longitudinal look at what was going on. Um, affiliation really helped them through that particular market situation. But those that, that, uh, that had affiliated later found themselves in distress. And so we have a curious dynamic going on that surely, surely requires us to understand better what's happening in rural communities. Um, in fact, I will be speaking at, at a session later on today because today is Rural Health Day. And um, I really wanna challenge us to think about rural differently, to realize that we've defined rural from a metropolitan perspective. That those, of, those of us who are defining these things live in metropolitan areas. And so there's generally a, a, a thinking that, well, you think rural, you think poverty, but that isn't necessarily the case. Rural is a, is a, is a very nuanced, complex space, place. And um, people choose to live in rural communities for a variety of reasons. And so I think we need to look at it from the other point of view looking at it outwards from being a rural setting and trying to understand the strengths and weaknesses as they're perceived uh, by rural communities rather than imposing urban and uh, metropolitan views on healthcare and health settings. So I think if we do that, it allows us to begin to understand the resilience and the issues of resilience that are necessary for these kinds of care facilities. Um, and healthcare systems in rural communities that I think we can also learn something about that would be instructive for urban settings. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a number of uh, wonderful studies that are demonstrating how well uh, ARC's uh, safety program for improving antibiotic use has been and it's really created a framework for understanding antibiotic stewardship in primary care. Um, the lessons I think that we've been learning have made it to the literature, but the real question and issue is how do we get it out of literature and back out into the care delivery systems? Um, and I think that's the struggle that we we're trying to address now as well for the future not just doing the science, but also moving the science out and into the clinics and into the health systems. So, um, but these three studies uh, are related to this one particular program that's had wonderful contributions and wonderful success uh, in long-term care facilities, in ambulatory facilities, and in a variety of other uh, locations. 
Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Bierman has, has led our, our efforts to try to understand how we provide care for people with multiple chronic conditions and, and a recognition that uh, as we age, we, we gain a chronic condition or we gain disabilities. And our systems by and large are not, uh, not receptive or not recognizing uh, this fact. And so we're looking uh, at a number of studies here that help us with clinical decision support, as well as trying to understand really what's going on with the care, with the care that people bring to the clinic in a way that allows us to, again, re-examine what we're doing and how we're doing it. Uh, just as I'm challenging us to think about rural differently, I'm, think, I'm challenging us to think about how we actually organize and deliver care for an aging population. And I wanna thank Dr. Berman, who's in the back here for leading that charge. Next slide, please. Uh, we've done some pretty amazing uh, and interesting analysis of you know, how you do practice transformation. And uh, that's all part of this same question about how do we deal with uh, people with multiple chronic conditions, how do we deal with an aging population? It's really at the heart of what ARC is intended to do, and that is to improve healthcare in the United States. And we can't improve healthcare unless we recognize that we need to transform, uh, we need to transform care, um, and in particular, primary care. So uh, we've been lucky enough, as many of you know, to be funded uh, to, to develop a center on primary care uh, research. And I'm looking forward to us expanding our ability to do more of that uh, in the coming years. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the other things that, that people often don't realize is that not only do we do research studies, but we also take those research studies and create tools and other forms of information that are useful for healthcare providers, for health systems leaders and others. Um, making healthcare safer is a, is a, uh, a website that on a regular basis uh, provides up-to-date information about safer uh, clinical practices. Um, and I think as I've mentioned this to other people and to health systems around the country, People don't know that this is available to them. They can just go online and find uh, playbooks, find all kinds of information that can help them uh, with the kinds of decision-making they're trying to make around uh, safety practices. Uh, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of our annual National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report. Um, it was just uh, released about um, three weeks ago maybe. Um, and so I, I encourage you to look at it. We're no longer doing the big paper versions of it. So you can find it if you need to print it and you need to, to knock down a couple of trees, uh, you can print it, but uh, it, it's online. And I encourage you to take a look at it because um, it's got some special focus on the on, on a number of areas that are really important to the, the administration and to our country uh, that have to do um, with a lot of the issues that are affecting our, our communities, including maternal health um, and, and others. Uh, we also have a, a new tool that I think uh, people need to know about. It's called CEDAR, and it's, a, uh, it's an effort to draw together the evidence uh, uh, that's available for, uh, for developers and others to build tools, apps, and other arrangements that's focused on care delivery and care delivery improvement. It's a it's kind of the, the best of uh, kind of location so that you can find all of the contributions that ARC has been making over the years in one single place. Um, it's evidence reports and a variety of other areas that I think people will be interested in. As you've heard uh, before, we also have uh, a beta version of the social determinants of health database available um, that 
is making that data available to researchers and, and healthcare systems and others who need information and don't want to go and sort of pull the different pieces of the social determinants of health data from various sources. Uh, they don't, you don't have to do that any longer because our staff have already done that. And so um, I encourage people to use that and to let people know about it. We're also really excited about this synthetic database uh, for research. It's, a, it's an all payer nationally representative claims database uh, based on 2016, which is kind of a, a, a prototype of the um, all, all payer claims database that we're trying to build and make available to states uh, across the country. Those who have uh, all payer uh, claims databases don't actually have all payers. Uh, because there are uh, ERISA exemptions, as you know. But uh, ARC does have that information. And so we're going to be helping states with all payer systems fill those gaps in their understanding. And um, we hope to also uh, create a synthetic database using this particular uh, uh, prototype for those states that don't have all payer systems. So we have a, we have a lot of, uh, we have lots of things that are, uh, being cooked up that you can begin to get a good feel for by using the synthetic database for researchers who um, who aren't familiar with working with uh, all payer claims data. Uh, and this is a good way for not only education, uh, but also for others who want to uh, begin to understand how to use this kind of data. Uh, next slide, please. Well, uh, I want to shift gears now, you know, this is our mission uh, to produce the scientific evidence that makes healthcare all these wonderful things. But rarely have we actually focused on what it means to produce the scientific evidence to make healthcare equitable. And so our equity effort, um, our equity agenda is really trying to understand what is it? What kind of scientific evidence is necessary? What do we need to know? to actually make healthcare more equitable. Next slide, please. As you know, um, dismantling structural racism is part of the president and the department's priorities. And so uh, this is also a high priority within ARC. Next slide, please. Now this is, I wanna give you a reason why this is a high priority. One of the messages that I've been uh, making over the over the course of the last few months is that uh, safety and quality issues are not equally distributed. Now, this is uh, a report from our quality uh, and disparities report uh, that illustrates uh, really the disparities that exist among racial and ethnic groups uh, with regard to the care that they receive. And uh, if you look down that first column that says worse, you'll see that um, African-Americans uh, largely have 45% of our measures on quality that are worse than the reference group, which is the non-Hispanic white population. And you can go down and see the uh, Asian Amer um, American Indian and Hispanic uh, numbers are also close to the 40% 40, 40 mark. How does that come about? Well, you know, we what we know is that misdiagnoses and overdiagnoses and poor treatment and management uh, contribute to not only unsafe practices, but also um, the inequities in the quality of care that people are receiving. And so, how do we begin to address this? What what are the handles that health systems and clinicians have to really change this picture? Next slide, please. Well, we held a health equity summit uh, that included a large number of people from, uh, from researchers across the spectrum, from uh, you name it, uh, primary care, tertiary care, uh, from uh, urban and rural sites, from uh, multiple racial and ethnic groups so that we could have different perspectives. And our real goal was to, first of all, come up with the ability to talk to one another about this issue because people use different language uh, and different 
understandings about what it means to have equitable care um, and what it means to address structural racism. From that, um, from that initial uh, leveling of, and, uh, of understanding, we were able to really draw out from people what they considered to be the main issues that needed to be addressed, at least from a scientific research perspective, and where there were potential leverage points for us to actually begin to think about how does one dismantle structural racism when the, within the US healthcare system? Well, the US healthcare system is already a, uh, segregated in many ways. Uh, most, most of the segregation is by social class and, or income. Um, but there are also other segre segregations. Uh, we have multiple healthcare systems um, that are that are serving uh, populations at in at the same time. Uh, Uh, these were the, these were the questions. Again, to try to address these questions. And uh, next slide, please. And this is what they came up with. The, uh, they, they came up with uh, what we kind of knew at the beginning with regard to the, the need for a common language in order to begin to, to address these issues. But they also came up with a recognition that uh, we, needed C, we needed to focus on C-suite and leadership issues um, to, to set the kind of stage and the culture within our healthcare delivery systems that address and structural racism as a, as a key concern. Um, there are other areas in which there was a recognition that we needed good ways of measuring what it meant to provide equitable health care. Um, and it's certainly an area that historically has been an area that uh, has been important for, for ARC, um, that is the development of measures to better understand phenomena that exist in our, in our particular um, health care system. They also talked about the kinds of studies uh, and the pragmatic design studies that were necessary to look at equity and, and structural racism within our healthcare system. Um, I think you have a, a snack that's looking at this issue as well and or has been looking at this issue um, as well. So I'll, I'll sort of move on from here and allow those discussions to take place uh, with the NAC. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, we're obviously not letting this go. Uh, we're we're going to be looking at how we begin to develop metrics, how we develop tools, and understand the processes that are involved, and in particular, uh, what the action steps are for ARC uh, as a result of this this summit. Um, we're trying to work out what the uh, agenda is for our external uh, research activities on, on healthcare equity. Um, and so um, we look forward to your advice and, and direction about how we, in fact, uh, can take what we've learned thus far to begin to put together a, a science research agenda that is useful. Uh, the findings are useful for healthcare delivery systems in uh, achieving this goal of providing equitable healthcare. Next slide, please. Okay, it looks like uh, I've been queued to take questions. <laughs> yes, you have. So um, <laughs> there, was, there was a lot, a lot of content in there. Um, so we will take questions uh, by order of, of hand raised. I'll, I'll, I'll track it on the on the Zoom, even for folks who are in the room. Um, you know, one, one of the questions, uh, but I'm going to take church, church privilege here and ask the first question without raising my hand. Um, so 
with the health equity and health equity summit that you that you described that work, what are the next steps uh, around that? I, there, you mentioned the snack. Um, you know, have the what what how how in your view do we actually leverage that resource um, to move this forward? Um, right now, we're we're trying to take the findings that we got from the the forum and uh, the work that we've been trying to do with regard to uh, how we structure the health equity agenda across the agency because health equity is something that cuts across everything that that we do, um, we have recognized that we have both an internal agenda because as an organization, we also suffer from this uh, inequity, um, in, these inequities in the way uh, we operate. Um, and whether it's how we figure out how we do our reviews and the, the diversity of our reviewers, perspectives, uh, location, a uh, whole variety of issues. So it's, it's it's a recognition that we also need to change the way we operate. Um, and more importantly, how we begin to define what the research agenda ought to be around uh, equity. That's kind of what that stair step was, uh, was all about that I was trying to show you. Each step has actually some agenda item that, that we need to address um, in order to move this agenda forward. How we do it. I, uh, that's still the big question. Well, that's we're here to we're here to at least give recommendations around that as well. So uh, thanks for that, Neil. You're up next. Great. So uh, very supportive of the equity agenda. Uh, I got some pushback from some of my members recently as we have a coalition uh, discussion about health equity uh, that we not equate inequity with structural racism. Well, we make clear that there are many different sources of inequity, age, gender, uh, sexual identity, geography. And so I, I would just encourage ARC to uh, you know, maybe frame it as we've taken on structural racism as one of the leading sources of inequity, but we recognize there are many other uh, inequities we have to fix. Well, that's, that's a great comment because that's exactly what came out of the forum as well. Um, while the, the underlying issues that have been recognized is um, uh, the racism that exists in our society as sort of a, a structural or foundational uh, piece, it, it also highlights in some cases or hides what in essence is a, a socioeconomic and structural sets of issues that we've seen in societies for centuries. And that is those with power do well and those without power uh, do less well. And um, whether you want to define power as resources in money or wealth or what have you, um, it, that's also part of our social structure. And you know, largely from a, a sociological perspective that, that, that difference that we see in our society is really what's underlying all of this. And part of that in America, is uh, race and ethnicity are really um, measures of that social structure uh, and difference in power and, and resources. Because um, all of us around this table know that race and ethnicity has no biological basis. Uh, thanks, I, there, was a, there was a note um, in the chat, Susan wanted to mention folks, uh, people living with disability, uh, disabilities uh, being in the equity uh, definition, which I know you guys do include uh, there. Yang Ling, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Vadiv. That's really- uh, Oops, we- one of, Yeah, the uh, presentation. We've lost her voice again. Hold on, I think we. I think it's probably us again, because she's, she's off. Yeah, we've got to get back on that. There we go. Hey, All right, now go. Can you hear me now? Yes, you're up. Yep. Yeah, thank you, and thank you. Uh, for the presentation, that's very helpful. And I was just um, I'm curious, what's your thoughts on this equity metrics, and uh, what is ARC's, uh, you know, short-term and long-term plan to develop the metrics, and whether we're going to work with, you know, NQF or those type of uh, organization to, you know, measure how we do as we go along to, you know, to uh, eliminate or uh, 
you know, improve the equity in healthcare. I'm not sure I caught all of that. I think you were asking about how we include our partners uh, like NQF in the measurement agenda and the, in the effort to try to understand what it means to provide equitable health care? Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, does the ARC has a short-term, a long-term goal or to develop equity metrics? That's why I'm curious your thoughts on that. And it's so important to work. Did you hear? Yeah, I mean, essentially, what, you know, what she's saying is, what, how do you, how, how are you know you're successful, and how are you going to incorporate some of the work that other ent other entities are working on to get there from a metrics and outcomes perspective? Yes, I and uh, I agree. We we need to try to develop those kinds of metrics to understand whether or not we're achieving uh, the goal. And that's that's really at the at the beginning stages of what we're doing right now is defining what that what those that agenda is, both for understanding whether or not we're achieving an equitable healthcare system, but also the kinds of metrics that are necessary for uh, in internal and operational uh, efforts to try to improve healthcare. Um, we don't have a we don't currently have a research agenda focused on this yet, uh, but it's part of the strategic thinking about where we need to invest in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you uh, as uh, for your uh, for your updates on uh, the state of of ARC. We're gonna we're gonna move to our next agenda item, which is oh, Aaron Grace. Uh, Aaron's our acting director for the Center for Quality Improvement and uh, Patient Safety, and we're going to be talking about it, uh, recommitting to advancing patient safety. Aaron, it's your show. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, thrilled to be here with all of you. We're uh, making sure I can see everything here. <laughs> oh, and, uh, okay, great. No, I'm on mute. No, okay, okay. So let me just try to find this. Okay, okay, great. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, there we go. Um, since Dr. Valdez uh, joined ARC, he's been had a laser focus uh, on patient safety and advancing patient safety, um, patient and workforce safety, and um, among other uh, important areas. Um, and he got the secretary's attention on the importance of moving safety forward uh, to the top of the agenda for HHS and HHS agencies, especially given declines in safety during and following the COVID-19 pandemic. And he cited the importance of a systems approach to patient safety and that patient and workforce safety are the underpinnings of other HHS and presidential priorities, such as equity, addressing long COVID, addressing climate change, et cetera. Some of the things we've already heard from Dr. Valdez this morning. Secretary Becerra then charged R to work across HHS to consider how best to renew our collective commitment to advancing patient safety which led to Monday's launch event, which was planned in partnership with ARC, CDC, CMS, and FDA. Next slide, please. This slide uh, using data from the CDC illustrates how several healthcare associated infections, which is a small part of patient safety, were declining from 2015 to 2019. You see the downward slope of the lines. Um, but then started to increase again uh, once the onset of the at the onset of the pandemic. Next slide, please. What was the convening to advance patient safety? And um, hopefully, many of you were able to tune in to the live stream, um, and so you probably know the answer to this question. But um, we had over twenty of the largest healthcare systems participated in person at the listening session. Healthcare system leaders, executive leaders were invited to bring a board member and a senior patient safety leader with them. Okay. Um, well, can you go 
back one slide. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so um, they were invited to bring um, a board member and a senior patient safety leader with them, and many of them did. And uh, national patient and family-led advocacy organizations focused on patient safety were also participating in the listening sessions. Next slide, please. The agenda included opening remarks from the secretary, followed by framing remarks from a patient and family advocate. And next, the senior leaders uh, from ARC, CDC, CMS, and FDA made brief remarks about their contributions and uh, agencies' contributions and recommitment to advancing patient safety. And this was followed by a listening session with healthcare system executive leaders and patient and family advocates. This part of the afternoon was live streamed. After a short break, we moved to um, uh, the board of trustees were, uh, uh, who were in attendance moved to a different room for a robust discussion on board engagement in patient and workforce safety. While the healthcare system patient and safety leaders met with HHS patient safety leadership for another listening session. Next slide, please. Of course, um, there's probably much more that people in the room wanted to say um, than could be expressed. And I think we gave each, each one 60 seconds or less to answer some um, pretty broad questions. Uh, and we wanna get feedback, additional feedback from those in the room, but not only that, um, from a broad range of stakeholders on how best to establish a national healthcare system action alliance to advance patient safety. Um, to make it most effective and useful. So HHS will soon be issuing a public request for information based on the questions posed at the convening. So I hope all of you here will uh, feel free to send in uh, your comments and we'll be discussing this, um, your comments here, but you can feel free to respond to the RFI. Um, next slide, please which um, uh, Dr. Valdez already showed this slide. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll um, about uh, looking at the equity and um, safe, uh, healthcare is not safe until it's safe for all. But we'll move to the next slide. Um, as noted previously, oh, next, there we go. So I guess there's a delay, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, HHS will be establishing an action alliance based on feedback from the listening sessions and from the RFI, which will soon be available. And this slide includes a link to the webpage with some brief information about the action alliance. And we anticipate building this out um, over time as, as the alliance uh, takes off. Uh, next slide, please. One uh, framework that will guide the Action Alliance will be the 2020 Safer Together, a National Action Plan to Advance Patient Safety. ARC co-chaired the National Steering Committee, or NSC, that produced the National Action Plan, and the NSC also included representatives from five other federal agencies, CDC, CMS, FDA, VA, and OSHA. So it was truly a public-private partnership that was about a quarter of the members of the NSC were um, from federal agencies. Next slide, please. The four foundational areas discussed in the National Action Plan are listed here and will serve as guide, post, guide posts for the Action Alliance. Next slide, please. As a reminder of some key elements of ARC's patient safety portfolio, ARC starts with health systems research to produce the evidence base for safety improvement. ARC has a broad portfolio of patient safety work across all healthcare settings and transitions between them and across a wide range of topic areas. ARC's patient safety work spans the research to implementation continuum that Dr. Valdez was talking about earlier, including research, data, measurement, tools and resources, dissemination and implementation, and in some cases, boots on the ground assistance to work with healthcare practitioners to implement the tools uh, uh, for safety improvement. As a health systems research organization, ARC looks at how the system works for individual harm reduction, such as falls reduction, improving accurate diagnoses, reducing infections, et cetera. At the same time, it is important to focus not only on individual harms, understanding the individual pieces of safety, but also addressing a total systems approach which is also discussed in the National Action Plan. In other words, it takes a bottom-up and a top-down approach, and ARC embraces both. Next slide, please. As this slide is also another reminder of 
uh, some of the resources available uh, from ARC. Uh, uh, we produce research and then use the research to develop tools and resources to support implementation. Next slide, please. The secretary uh, during the um, convening also charged ARC and HHS to develop a cross HHS work group to advance patient safety. Um, and the purpose of the interdepartmental work group is to coordinate and align patient safety activities across the department and to establish and co-lead the action alliance. Next slide, please. And I know Dr. Valdez is eager to share some takeaways that he had from the executive leaders listening session and the board of directors facilitated discussion. Dr. Valdez. Thanks very much. Uh, we had a really great response to this convening. Um, uh, more than two thirds of the invitees of the 30 largest healthcare systems uh, joined us. Uh, we had more than 100 people in, in the house, <laughs> in the room. Um, we were constrained by the, by the size and, and the invitation list. I can tell you that my email uh, received lots of emails regarding why didn't I get an invitation? Where is my invitation? Uh, how can you get me in? Um, so it was a hot ticket. Um, it was such a hot ticket that we had actually more than 800 people who were live streaming. And I discovered last night that some of those single hits actually had groups of people watching uh, on the computer. Um, I, would, I would summarize my takeaways uh, from the gathering in three words enthusiasm, simplification, and workforce. Um, the, the people who were in the room were extraordinarily enthusiastic about the fact that HHS had convened them around this important topic. Um, many of the health systems don't have an opportunity to talk about what's going on in their systems and their communities and what they're, what they're tr trying to do or what they're trying to deal with and looked at this as an opportunity like many, many times when you get together socially, much of the real work takes place in that informal interaction. And there was a lot of that going on uh, before the session and in between and the breaks and, and afterwards. Um, and that tells me that, that we've struck on the right thing. There was a great recognition that patient and uh, workforce safety are really a vehicle for uh, recovering from the pandemic. And uh, it's an opportunity, I think, that ARC um, looks forward to and the department looks forward to helping health systems uh, get back on their feet and, and to begin to re-examine how we do our work and, and to make it not only safer, but of higher quality to the American public. One of the issues that people brought up was the fact that, you know, it's really complicated. We need we need to figure out how we can do this in a simpler way. We're asked to uh, report on uh, hundreds of measures by different payers. Every payer has got their own set. We really need a standard set. Is it something that, that ARC could do to identify you know, a standard set of measures that people need to report on so that we can actually uh, make this simpler instead of having people trained to respond to hundreds of or thousands of different uh, measurements. And lastly, the, the issue around workforce was the fact that, that they're all facing instability um, in the workforce. Um, that instability led to protocols uh, for the need to, to help people understand how particular uh, processes are done in their particular system when they had people from the outside coming in. Um, they recognize that bringing people from the outside also increases the cost of labor um, and that this shortage of labor um, also meant that it had direct impacts on the quality of care that people were providing. So that recognition, I think, is extraordinarily important uh, to move this agenda forward. Um, you know, the funny thing uh, that I discovered when I went to the board session um, the board members started talking about these frameworks and tools that they relied on to, to try to do their work of governance of health systems. And uh, little, little did they know that they were quoting the names of tools that were developed by ARC. 
So that told me we still need to do a better job of marketing our, our products so that people actually know where they're, they're coming from. And, um, but I was, I was extraordinarily pleased to find that our, our tools are being used and they are being found useful. And I know that if we can understand what other kinds of tools people need and want, that we can help develop those here at ARC again so that people can be successful in this agenda of making uh, patients safe and the workforce safe. Um, because the underlying safety of our workforce is, is also a driver on, on this burnout issue that was raised a little earlier. Thank you. Um, uh, next slide, but you could leave the pictures up <laughs> instead of the slide. But um, uh, I had the privilege of uh, being at the patient safety uh, leaders uh, listening session with uh, colleagues from CDC, CMS, and FDA. And um, at that session, you know, the executive leader session was maybe at the 10,000 foot level and the patient safety leader session was um, a little bit more boots on the ground, um, examples of the healthcare systems, challenges, successes, and potential solutions to advance patient safety. And um, the discussion ranged from the need, which was a sort of surprise to me for standardized training um, around patient safety, uh, and even asking, you know, could you HHS develop a standardized training? Um, and also talked about the importance of uh, starting um, an understanding of, of patient safety from when you're in school before you enter the workforce. You know, all medical schools, all nursing schools should have um, training in, in patient safety. And then when you're in the workforce, um, it shouldn't be a one and done. When you start your onboarding, you get your patient safety training and then it, you don't hear from it anymore. Um, it should be an annual thing until it's ingrained. And this might also help some of the, um, with the turnover, uh, they talked about you know keeping up with the um, all these new faces coming in or contract labor. Um, how do you uh, quickly um, help them understand the the safety culture of of your organization? Um, so that that was sort of a, a interesting to me. And this, at the same time, they talked about if we do this, though, you have to you have to find five other things to take away <laughs> from from the clinicians um, and the healthcare workforce uh, work that they do uh, for documentation and simplification, which Dr. Valdez um, mentioned. And, and this session kind of got down to the nitty gritty of what what some of those things could mean. Um, and uh, there was also a, a general um, sense that I felt at least and Dr. Valdez said this as well, in terms of healthcare systems, um, I think they want to share and they want to learn from others best practices around patient safety. So that was, um, there was a sense of excitement and I heard some um, things from people who were in the room but not necessarily seated at the table as well. Um, and a sense of excitement about a public private partnership, um, HHS being more coordinated uh, as, as well as working hand in hand um, with the health systems and the Action Alliance. So I think we've got a, Great start um, and all due to Bob's vision. And I also wanna do a shout out to David Myers who um, with his leadership and partnership, um, without his leadership and partnership, uh, Monday would not have happened, I think. So um, and lots of other people to thank, but we're doing that in the background. So what we wanted to spend the bulk of our time for this session doing was to um, pose to NAC members the questions that we posed executive leaders and, um, and have a conversation uh, from your perspective. What are you, you hearing or what are you experiencing? Um, and uh, again, I hope, hope you'll answer the, respond to the RFI as well, but um, we'd like to have some good discussion around this here. And I don't know, Edmondo, do you wanna facilitate the discussion? Okay. Very good, well, thank you. Both uh, Dr. Valdez and, and Erna for for your for your um, insights and comments on this uh, really really important work and I'm I'm really glad to hear about the enthusiasm coming um, from really all sides around around this 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 important work so that's great you you all um, on the NAC you got the questions ahead of time on your in your pre reading material so you're familiar with these questions. Um, Let's let's go ahead and just take some comments and, and questions from the from the group. So if I see your hand up first. Well, thanks so much, and thank you both, and thanks to all those involved for um, 
the reinvigoration of this safety agenda. I think um, it has obvious face validity. It has obvious numbers validity. And it really meets the moment, it meets the moment in this peri-pandemic, whatever we are in, um, in a uh, workforce in crisis mode. And in a, in a con from a consumer perspective, you know, healthcare for all that we spend, for all that we invest in it is not safe and dignified enough. One of the observations that I and others have is that systems and safety improvement often moves at the speed of trust within the workforce or between the workforce and patients and their families. Our systems in healthcare have to be worthy of the trust that individuals, communities, and health workers invest in them in order to be seen as trustworthy, right? I mean, this is not just wordplay, it's, it's true. I'm a clinician, many, you're all consumers or uh, experts in healthcare or otherwise. So if, if we're to merge some of these agendas together of safety, equity, community engagement, systems improvement, it strikes me that we, know, we don't need to just talk about trust, but we also need to perhaps flip the lens a little bit about safety. Because if you look at the NAT 17 safety goals and our usual way over the last 20 years of doing safety, we go to where we're comfortable. We go to numbers, we go to processes, we go to systems, because we know that safety events are systems failures. That's all true, I get it, you get it. But I would argue we need to re-embody as opposed to disembody the way we're thinking about safety. When you hide it behind numbers, oh, it's an error rate we're reducing, right? Well, that error rate is made up of individuals and families who experience outcomes. And they may be system failures, but those are individually experienced. Those workforce safety events were individually and collectively experienced by a workforce in crisis. And so re-embodying this gets us out of our comfort level. because We wanna count things, we, we're at ARC and we wanna measure and, and, and we wanna sort of look at population trends those data points are made up of individual stories. We have to do both. It's not an either false dichotomy to reinvest and reinvigorate our understanding from the patient safety and patient advocate community of what this actually means and intersect it with the equity agenda to hear from the communities that we serve about how this all comes together. So I would just really vote for that. And uh, I would also just finally in my last comment point to the necessity of perhaps looking at some of the, I, you know, it's now longstanding work in communi communication resolution programs. What happens in how we respond to a harm event? Do we say we're sorry or do we hide behind the legal infrastructure? Why can't we say we're sorry? Why can't we build systems that say they are sorry, that compensate people when they should be compensated and then work to systematize the learnings of the error review process? That doesn't just blame that person who dispensed the med, but looks at the whole system and makes the promise and the commitment to the family that it will never happen again. That's how you become worthy of trust in order to build the trustworthiness that you will get to systems improvement at a population level. Got to count both, but you have to look at the stories and see this as a rehumanized, not a dehumanized set of issues. Wow, that that's a, that's great stuff, and that trust it's um, it's so critical um, that we get that right. Uh, Patrick, I saw you for uh, next up. I'm sure this is um, th thank you. This is really exciting work, and uh, I'm so glad that Arc is really taking this forward in partnership. In partnership, oh, sorry, you told me to unmute myself. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I'm so glad that ARC is taking this forward in partnership with some of the leading um, health systems in the country. I just wanna emphasize that ARC has, uh, of course, already invested so much um, in patient safety um, and already has so many tools and so much expertise. And I think it's really important to tie this effort in with some of the things that ARC has already been doing and has been doing. And I'm just gonna mention quickly four specific examples. 
So one is um, the work of the um, SNAC um, that we did last year uh, under Leah Binda's leadership and, um, and Tina Hernandez Boussard, um, really to help us collectively understand some of the key gaps with respect to performance measurement in the quality measurement enterprise. Um, and I think uh, that process eventuated in some specific recommendations that I hope can move forward and continue to inform the work of the, uh, of the Alliance and the HHS work group. Um, second, of course, um, is the uh, AHRQ patient safety indicators, which are part of the portfolio at CEQIPS and really uh, a very important partnership um, with uh, Dr. Ling and, and CMS. Um, so really uh, CMS has made an ongoing commitment um, to the patient safety indicators to ensure that those continue to be endorsed by NQF and continue to be improved. Um, and so I would hope that um, again, given the importance of data and measurement, um, there would be opportunities to leverage what ARC has already done and continue to expand and improve the patient safety indicators. Um, third, I'll mention um, the uh, patient safety network or PSNet also within the CEQIPS portfolio, um, which is um, a fantastic platform. I'm, I'm honored to be involved in it, but it's a fantastic platform for disseminating information um, and for um, education and training. I see a lot as I look at the, um, as I look what, what came out, the action plan, uh, the uh, implementation resource guide that came out from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Movement. I see a lot in there about the importance of ongoing training and education. Well, ARC provides continuing education credits um, through PSNet um, with um, cases, uh, uh, commentaries, spotlights. So there are a tremendous amount of educational tools um, that ARC makes available through PSNet. And again, I would hope that we could leverage that existing infrastructure um, to inform these agency-wide efforts. Um, and then finally, um, believe it or not, um, we are moving towards ICD-11 and AHRQ has um, sponsored a, a process through a conference grant mechanism um, that's uh, led by uh, Harold Pincus and others uh, working with WHO to introduce an entirely new quality and safety ontology into ICD-11. So that in the future, uh, ICD-11 data will actually drive quality and safety improvement within healthcare organizations in a way that ICD-10-CM will never be able to do. Um, and so I hope that there may be opportunities. Again, this requires international collaborations, uh, not just um, with, uh, within HHS, but I hope there may be opportunities, again, to leverage the work that ARC has already helped to support um, to uh, potentially move forward ICD-11 implementation. The National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics is strongly in favor of starting that road towards ICD-11 implementation. We know it's probably a five to 10 year road, but the sooner it starts, the sooner we can uh, improve our data systems um, for uh, monitoring and improving quality and safety. So four points, um, thank you. Thanks, thanks Patrick. Uh, I, I will take a little shares privilege here. I wanted to pull in, uh, with apologies to David Myers, I wanted to pull in um, his comment into the, into the public sphere. First, he, he uh, uh, thanked, uh, thanked Aaron uh, for her um, calling calling him out and his um, support of this work um, and specifically uh, mentioned uh, that this is some of the most important and timely work that he's been privileged to be involved with at ARC and um, noted it was a team effort and will require continued teamwork and trust back to soft point um, to continue uh, moving forward so I wanted to pull that into the um, to the public sphere. Uh, Susan you're up next. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to thank Bob and Aaron and David and everyone at ARC that was involved in really making this meeting last Monday happen. Um, I think it's an excellent start, but I think we've got a lot of work to do. And I also agree with everything that Asaf and um, Patrick just said, in terms of ARC's role and things that need to be done, 
I want to underscore the, there were several recommendations that came out of the snack about measurement and ARC's role in measurement. Um, one that that I think, and I, I actually have no idea how to make this happen, but we talked a lot about the need to have national quality goals that would include safety, obviously, that we could then use to guide the reduction of measures that are no longer worthwhile and create a common set of measures that are simple and actionable that could then be retired over time as those national quality goals change. Um, but I think that is incredibly important because the, the measurement tower of Babel is just making everybody crazy. And it's also very expensive. Um, and I think art could play a really important role in that, bringing together, excuse me, many of the stakeholders that need to be at the table, including other federal agencies. I think that um, there are other things that would be incredibly helpful that I know the Lucian Leap Institute is advocating for the Patients for Patient Safety US, which is uh, an arm and affiliate of the WHO Patients for Patient Safety around um, trying to figure out how we could mandate the implementation of the Survey of Patient Safety Culture surveys in the various settings that they are designed to evaluate. The data from those surveys are incredibly helpful to address the culture issues. We know that they are linked to patient experience scores. And I personally think and know from previous research that part of our workforce issue is that our, our employees don't feel like they're working in safe environments. And nobody wants to be in an environment where they are terrified that either they will be harmed or they will harm another patient. Um, and so I think bringing together that culture data, which is actionable, and many organizations use it effectively in that way, and also having that as a comparative database would be enormously valuable in terms of benchmarking who's doing well in what settings and how do we share that information across hopefully more robust learning health system activities. Um, I also think that um, what Bob said about doing a better job of marketing, um, I um, co-chaired the National Steering Committee on, on Patient Safety's Patient Engagement Group with Steve Littlejohn who is a patient safety advocate. And we included in our recommendations um, that are part of the action plan, many ARC resources um, that we think are incredibly um, helpful. The Patient Safety Advocacy Universe thinks they're wonderful. And I think Asaf mentioned CRP programs, the CANDOR toolkits and other things like that. But we really need to, um, broadcast those, share those, because they also are very important for training. And in a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to give a presentation to the NASM um, Healthcare Sciences Board on the state of patient safety, um, which was actually a fairly daunting activity. And, um, you know, we, um, we talked a lot about this and about these tools. And I think now is the time that we really need to promote them. And one of the other issues that came out of a lot of the background work that we did talking with safety leaders in different organizations to put that presentation together was the incredible importance of training. I think many of us that have been involved in the safety movement since its inception with the publication of To Air is Human, we sort of forget that all the people leading our health systems we're not around then. And there's an enormous amount of training and um, consciousness raising, frankly, that we need to do. And I also think that ARC and the ARC research um, opportunities could be very valuable in helping health system leaders connect the dots, that safety is not a freestanding activity. It is integrally related to dealing with the workforce issues, the equity issues, the patient experience issues. Um, so I'm gonna stop there, but thank you. Thanks, Susan. I do wanna really appreciate your comments. I wanna call out one 
um, one part of her comments, which is, I'm not sure it gets highlighted enough, which is the cost of reporting itself. Uh, oh. And so, oh. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just <a> try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know, uh, right? And so, as you, as you, as you, because you, um, uh, Bob mentioned this, you know, this, this, this idea of simplicity. But part of it is because complex things are costly, right? And so, can uh, can I, I make one that. comment about that? Sorry, <laughs> I I actually think that the data reporting and the measurement is actually, in some respects, a very sophisticated form of resistance to doing anything because our staff are so busy collecting the data that they don't have a clue or the time to actually use the data for improvement. And so, but, but they feel like they're actually doing something because they're just pulling together all this data that sits on a shelf and nobody even knows how to interpret it. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm with you, Susan, I'm with you. Caroline, you're up next. Thank you. I uh, appreciate all of the work that AHRQ has done. It has been an incredible amount of work and productivity despite the pandemic and peri-pandemic. It's incredible to learn about. Uh, wearing both of my hats, I'll wear my payer hat first. I think that payers do play a critical role in patient safety, uh, looking in particular at what is and is not covered in terms of promoting patient safety as well as being able to sit on top of all of the data. So in a single hospital system or health system, they know what they know, but they don't know all that's happening outside those bonds, especially referring to Asif as the individual who goes from system to system or provider to provider. I think leveraging all payer databases and payers in this will be uh, an important part of the group moving forward. Next, I want to wear my behavioral health hat. Uh, having been a psychiatrist and internist, I can tell you that the settings of care are wildly different. And if we look at safety in the space of clinical care for providers, psychiatrists experience and nurses who are working in that setting experience uh, 68 per, I think, 1,000 events compared to a much, much tinier number for other providers. So in terms of safety in the patient setting, it's incredible to look at. I'm bringing that up often because psychiatry hospitals, residential treatment centers, and other sites of care are often excluded from hospital systems. And I would implore you very much to pull in psychiatric hospitals, standalone hospitals, residential treatment centers into um, the work being done on patient safety. Uh, finally, um, wearing yet another of my hats, from a pharmacy point of view, we look at medication errors inside the hospital uh, as being a huge part of patient safety. I daily see the result of errors that occur outside of the hospital setting. Uh, again, all payer databases um, looking at a higher level of where individuals are getting their medications filled, who's prescribing. Um, all clinicians in the room will know what I refer to as the Ziploc bag phenomenon of someone coming into your office. Um, in the future, as we look at other initiatives, I would also ask that you consider polypharmacy. Thanks, Caroline. Great call out. Uh, Kathy, you're up. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to put on my nursing hat, um, representing the largest segment of the healthcare workforce as we're talking about workforce and outcomes and hospital acquired conditions. Um, and uh, build on, on Carolyn's comments that it's probably time to really take a, a hard look at attribution of the healthcare team, who is contributing to the outcomes for the people that we're taking care of, and how do we uniquely tease them out. Um, and unfortunately for nursing and many other members of the healthcare team, we can't do it with an ICD code. Um, which is really designed for billing. So we're, we're gonna have to get better about 
um, being able to tease out the unique contributions of, uh, of the healthcare team and what, uh, what constitutes a high functioning healthcare team um, and a long comprehensive look at those teams related to patient outcomes, which I hope then would lead us to some recommendations and quality metrics that could relate to staffing uh, and, the and the healthcare team itself. Um, we, we really do have a, a crisis, particularly in nursing right now with uh, a less experienced, less tenured workforce. And, uh, and that has us all looking at what, so how to look at nursing differently to make sure that nursing is fun functioning at its highest level of practice, um, the importance of surveillance and monitoring to keeping patients safe. Um, and then what other members of the healthcare team can supplement the workforce to contribute to the best outcomes for the patient. We also have an opportunity, and this um, speaks to the whole concept of, do we concentrate now more on generating evidence or studying implementation? Um, and we, that leads us to the need to reduce unnecessary care variation. If I've got an, exper an extremely inexperienced healthcare team and I have um, provide care providers that um, that would prescribe or treat the same condition extremely differently. And I've got to know all of those things. It makes it, hard, makes it harder for my team to be competent and for our patients to have, have the best outcomes they can. So I, I, reducing unnecessary care variation is something I think uh, is worthy of um, lots of study and, uh, and resources around. The other point I want to make that I'm, I haven't heard yet is how can we increase the capacity and the competency of the healthcare consumer to report quality? What is quality for them? And how can we better teach them to tell us what is quality? And, and perhaps some work around that domain as well. Thank you. Yeah, really, really great point. Shanling, you're up next. Thank you, Amalo. Um, I want to really uh, thank you, the uh, ARC, and you know, work with uh, HS and the stakeholders, and to create this patient safety alliance. And I mean, the healthcare patient safety is the core principle in healthcare. That's how I was thinking, you know, quality and safety. And one thing, um, you know, we heard a lot about. Uh, you know, creating a learning process. I think that this is a very critical because the learning process is enable us to know, you know, how we are doing and how we can correct our actions where we going, you know, taking care of patients. And I want to emphasize the important thing about this learning process is a real time learning process. You know, we really don't want, we learn this thing, uh, two, three, three years down the road, we still look at the back and say, whoop, our infection increased and lots of people being killed. And we don't want, or harmed, we don't want to look at that. And I think based on what we have done, there's a system that have been created during the pandemic. I think we have a capability to really track the incident, adverse events, or anything that we want to learn in near real time. I'm not mean saying, you know, today has something happened, we learned it right today. But, you know, within the time window, you know, a few months, maybe half a year, we could uh, disseminate what we have learned um, that we can prevent a certain type of a medical harm. I mean, example is recently there was an article by VA Hospital and they published, I think, in patient safety, Journal of Patient Safety, if I remember correctly. And they talk about their experience about reducing quality during the pandemic. I mean, this health system, VA system, was able to reduce the infection where other systems have, have all basically increased infection. And that and really underscore 
the opportunity that may have been missed that we could have a system built that real-time learning, that lesson could be learned among inter, inter uh, agencies, among the systems, and among the facilities. And the other thing I want to point out, this real-time collecting, you know, the monitoring or learning system is to really have a patient report outcome built in the system. I think we have talked about it in the snack. Uh, a group and also many times at these meetings, I think the time has really come to really build a patient report outcome into this real time learning system. And as I have been talked about, you know, the trust, how critical important in healthcare. For consumers, trust probably is number one. If you don't trust this healthcare system, you will not get care. You probably will be harmed actually. Just like people refused to go in hospital during the COVID. And that could happen because medical error and because you know, any experience, traumatic experience they they had themselves or with their family members. But the the um, the trust is building on well, if we can provide the best quality and safety care. But also it depends on whether the uh, the care is transparent. I mean, the, uh, I think one of the core principles in this uh, safety alliance is culture. And we all know the healthcare culture, sometimes I have to say very honestly, is a secrecy. It's not shared with the patient family and even not shared among the facilities and system. I think the time has come that we create a transparent culture in safety tell patient family what happened and tell the facilities uh, among the facility, this is a happened at our place. And we have a way to think about how to move forward to reduce the care, to reduce the uh, adverse events we would like to share with you. So I think that that's, we, we need to create a, you know, more transparent, um, you know, the cultures in the healthcare system. And the one thing I want to point out is the, uh, you know, ARC have, you know, remarkably produce the patient safety report over years. A lot of those data come from the PSO, but those PSO data, lots of them are not transparent. I'm not saying transparent to tell who did what, but transparent in a way that could share, meaningfully share among all healthcare system. I think we need to make this you know, like the data collections from PSOs also make transparent to build a more trust in the healthcare system among the healthcare workers and also to the patient, to the family and to the general public. So that's just my comment. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thanks, thanks, Yangling. And a and, uh, couple, couple points I wanna, I wanna um, call out here. So Yangling as well as Kathy both, um, you know, kind of talked about this idea of the consumer perspective of quality um, or patient perspective of quality. Um, the other, the other, the other point um, I wanted to call out, I think, is consistent with um, Yanling's comments uh, that Patrick put in the chat that I want to bring into public, um, which was this idea of a national patient safety board, which would be analogous to a national transportation safety board to investigate outbreaks of patient safety problems, break down barriers across organizations, agencies, states, really kind of improve that communication. So I want to bring that, that idea into the public. Uh, we're running short on time. The folks whose hands are raised right now, um, I'll try to get you as best as we can. You have 60 seconds or less each, each person that, that we're going to go through, because um, I actually want to hear from all of you. So um, on my list, Kanan, you're up next. Thank you, Edmundo. And uh, again, kudos to uh, the ARC, including uh, Bob and um, Aaron for taking this initiative forward. Uh, I'll try to keep my comments short. So one, I, I mean, this is overall great. It, it, as I pointed out, it really builds up enthusiasm. There's so much to talk about, which then brings up the question when you look at the Action Alliance, what is it that they need to be doing from a scope point of view? Because th there's so much to do. Uh, the question, uh, in order for the alliance to work well moving forward, they may just need to look at 
what, what, what's the scope that they're going to operate in. And to feed along with that, they may want to develop some immediate, intermediate, and long-term strategies and start looking at what needs to be addressed. Otherwise, it's very easy to get lost in so much of the patient safety stuff that goes on on a daily basis. The second point is related to cultural safety. This has been touched upon, and I'm going to specifically emphasize the importance of psychological safety, and particularly as related to teaming. Um, particularly when we have so much significant turnover that's currently happening, and the, um, and with new staff coming on board, I think the concept of a uh, concept of teaming becomes hugely important, along with uh, psychological safety, in order to be able to provide that culture and safe care that our patients deserve. And I think, I thought Erin was going to allude to this when she talked about some of the best practices and approaching medical school, nursing school, is to start looking at IPE, uh, uh, interprofessional education, and maybe even using simulation as a way to enhance that psychological safety environment or teaching that could potentially happen there before folks come on to uh, work. The second is related to data analytics. I think there's so much data here. And the question is, what do we, that's been collected related to patient safety. What is it that one could do from a predictive and a prescriptive modeling that might help healthcare institutions down the road is something that the Alliance could help out in that regard. And a last point is related to where the future. Uh, um, and um, so far we've been depending on reports uh, on patient safety, I think, and as we all know, we capture about 10 to 15 or even less, depending on the culture of safety in a particular institution. So, what is it that we need to be looking at from a technology point of view, whether it's electronic trigger tools, things that we probably should be looking ahead uh, in terms of what needs to be done now so that we are all well prepped in terms of how we can best take care of our patients safely down the road. So thank you, Edmundo. Awesome. Thanks, Kanan. Uh, Neil. 60 seconds. Uh, two, two points. One is uh, a big believer in public reporting. So, uh, you know, when we talk about transparency, uh, I, I am the uh, regional leader for the Leapfrog Group for Southeastern PA in Delaware. We've had many uh, hospital and uh, quality and safety professionals and CEOs tell us that that public reporting is what made the difference and got them to invest more in patient safety. So we can't lose that. And we know that some of the ARC PSIs are embedded in the leapfrog groups work. So thank you. Uh, the second point is so much of the focus in uh, patient safety has been on facility-based care, hospitals, nursing homes. And I really think there's an opportunity for ARC to get much more involved in ambulatory uh, measurement, what are the measures, particularly going back to what Caroline said, uh, maybe starting with medication errors, which are coming really as much out of the ambulatory setting as the inpatient setting. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity to develop some standard measures and uh, test them out. Awesome. Thanks, Neil. Quick, quick point to folks. Uh, if you put a, if you put a note in chat, it does, it's not part of the public. So no one's seen it and it's not actually officially kind of advice coming from that. So if you have an important point, you got to say it um, at some point. Um, uh, chat's really kind of internal at this point. Kamal, you're next. Thank you. And I want to thank um, the HRQ um, for and the HHS agencies for this important um, uh, discussion. And I will just highlight that the my understanding is that the recording of the convening will be available shortly. And so I really encourage everyone to listen to it, share it with others. I want to double click on some points made uh, originally by Asaf and Susan about the trust um, and, and then Youngling's trend, uh, concepts of transparency. And if we think about safety culture, which is really the organization, no matter whether it's ambulatory, whether it's facility, whatever setting, um, it's really the culture um, that supports and promotes patient safety. So this, you know, really is the foundation of really measurement improvement no matter what we do and I want to highlight you know something that was said previously that around psychological safety um, and that there are really now evidence-based ways of you know as, as kind of mentioned teaming of improving sort of psychological safety and I also want to acknowledge the critical importance of things like uh, post-clinical event debriefing as a way of tying together wellness culture of safety and quality improvement. 
Outstanding. Uh, thank you. Henry, you're up. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'll keep it short. Um, so uh, having been involved in you know, leading quality safety and experience at two large academic medical centers, as well as now being at an airline, I just would encourage that any additional endeavors on safety really take in some external perspectives. Um, I've heard some of those comments made about NTSB and teaming. Um, you know, I'm personally going through flight attendant training. 99% of which is unseen to most customers, but the entire airline industry, I think is on a different level of safety uh, compared to medicine. Um, and it's it, it gets to the very basics of training, assessment of competence and maintenance of competence. Uh, something that we don't do in healthcare very well with regards to quality, safety, experience or equity. Thanks, Henry. Uh, Judge, you're... Uh, I just want I want to add the science and the technology aspects back to the patient safety uh, paradigm and diagnostic area, uh, which is a recent uh, priority of ARC, uh, could be due to lack of information. You don't have information, you make a wrong diagnosis, or could it be a slip. You have information but missed it, or due to knowledge, you simply do not understand the problem at all, either due to training. You the trainer, you don't have a training to do this, or the science is not there. So basically, in order to improve the overall, that one science advances, we have better diagnostic tools and techniques we can do better. And also technology, uh, especially with all the data, we can do some rare uh, disease diagnosis better than we could before that can have a lot of uh, providers at front end. Thank you, Jaji. Uh, Krista, I have you. Um, I'll read from my notes because I'm very long winded, so I want to stay on topic um, as a patient advocate that is speaking actually for um, patients that are boots on the ground. Um, you know, patient families have got to be involved in all aspects of government research innovation, because it's those stories that's going to improve patient safety and harm. As Asaf said that you can't go by data. Those are numbers. Numbers are actual person and their family members. Um, Everyone has said there's no trust. There's no transparency. You know, truth telling should not be an option at all. I mean, I mean, truth telling, you just need to tell the truth. A lot of my clients are like, you know, it's not patient centered care, it's health care, uh, health care centered. They do not believe that y'all care about them when they walk into those facilities. They immediately, that's why I'm a patient advocate. They come to us to prevent harm. Um, there need to be new HCAP measures that include patient experience regarding their patient safety um, experience and better data to um, know the magnitude of harm that's going on in healthcare. Um, and I don't know why information blocking is not being enforced. Um, as an advocate, I rely on information through the portal. It's either not there, it's inaccurate, um, it's delayed. And what is it, 80% of you know, misdiagnosis is due to miscommunication? You know, I think in the communication, it needs to have near misses in there so a patient can say, you know, that's not what the conversation was. That's not what you said, or I didn't hear that correctly. That'll address some of the um, communication issues that patients have if they actually efficiently use the portal the way it should. And it's, it's a law, you know, why can't we mandate information blocking? And then, you know, access um, is a huge, huge issue. Um, we were talking about rule settings and equity. I don't understand why telemedicine is going away because a lot of my, in Alabama, there's a lot of rural settings and they rely on rural. And now it's, we're not seeing new patients and we don't do telemedicine anymore. So how is that access or equitable care? You know, especially someone that has to take off time for work or rides the bus or gets childcare, you know, they benefit from telemedicine because they don't have to take off work. They don't have to get childcare. They don't have to drive two hours from their location. And so I, you know, think telemedicine should be an option for everyone. Thank you, Krista. We can have an offline conversation about the utility of patient portals. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. Andy, you're up. Um, I started, I uh, know the, the actual transcript of the session is not up yet. The, the, what I've seen online is really aspirational and high level. It's kind of inarguable aspects of patient safety. I'd love this agency to work with them to prioritize what we should do first and next. I think we, you know, I think 
uh, Susan's comments about data really resonated with me because I think we spent a lot of time collecting data but not using the data. So there may be opportunities there I was also struck by your setup, which showed a slide of patient safety trends kind of going in the right direction until the pandemic. Uh, and I wonder the degree to which we have not spent enough time thinking about whether we're, we, that was the right speed or whether the pandemic now we have to apply different or new measures to what is a new workforce. Kathy's comments about nursing turnover with the same physician and patient workflow, turn, those, that teams are very much different now than they used to be. So I would encourage this agency to work with the, the uh, IHI and the larger group to think about whether we're going to be putting old wine in new bottles and it's just not the right set of tools for the current state we're in. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. That's our that's our last uh, comment. I will I will bring in one other comment from the chat again, uh, reminding the NAC members that the what's in the chat is not brought into the public, but actually in reference back to the previous um, um, comments, uh, actually from the director's report, um, David Schmitz had actually commented and I, and I just thought this was um, important to bring into, into um, public here is, and I'm gonna read um, uh, David's comment here, which was, I wanna commend and agree with the comments on rural health and rural communities. Rural communities have unique needs, but also unique resources and capabilities which should be accounted for with regard to Access and quality. I think it's actually consistent with some of the things Chris is saying as well. So uh, David agrees with this um, that that um, yeah, focus on rural will empower existing rural resilience and improvements in healthcare delivery. Overall, really engaging conversation around this important topic. I appreciate everyone um, leaning in um, and providing perspectives. This is uh, this is really great work. We're going to take a break. It's a ten minute break. We will start sharply at one thirty. Thank you. Uh, next topic here. We're jumping into the next topic here, which is an uh, update on uh, the PCOR Trust Fund subcommittee uh, um, of the National Advisory Council. So the PCOR Trust Fund SNAC. So there's a lot of acronyms in there. Um, so let's let's start with. Um, I think Karen is going to go to uh, give us an update on on that, and then uh, we'll dive into it a little bit deeper. So let's uh, let's get going. Hello, um, so I'm Karen Rhodes. I'm Chief Implementation Officer at AHRQ, uh, responsible for the strategic planning and oversight of ARC's portion of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Trust Fund, or the PCOR TF. So the goal of this session is to discuss the report and recommendations from uh, ARC's subcommittee of the National Advisory Committee, which we call a SNAC. Uh, so the PCOR Trust Fund SNAC. It's composed of a diverse group of subject matter experts <clears throat> advising the NAC on ARC's PCOR Trust Fund investments. So we were really fortunate to have Dr. Kristen Dillon serve as the subject matter expert and subcommittee chair for this work. Kristen is a family physician with expertise in health policy, rural health care, and public health. Most recently, she was senior advisor to the pandemic response unit for her home state of Oregon. During 2020, Dr. Dillon was the health policy advisor for the leadership in the U.S. House of Representatives. And before that, she was the executive director of an Oregon Medicaid coordinating care organization, so one of the CCOs. Her clinical experience encompasses 25 years providing outpatient, inpatient, emergency department, and maternity care in rural health centers and critical access hospitals. But before I turn this meeting over to Dr. Dillon, I need to first provide a brief background for the public uh, on the PCOR Trust Fund and ARC's congressional authorizations to give you an update on ARC's strategic plan, where we are in the process of getting uh, external stakeholder input. So next slide. Um, so, um, the Patient-Centered uh, Outcomes Research Trust Fund was established under the ACA to provide funding to support the conduct and dissemination of and data infrastructure for PCOR. Uh, PCOR is defined as patient 
patient-centered outcomes research, which is designed to provide decision makers with objective scientific evidence on the comparative effectiveness of different treatments, services, and other interventions used in healthcare. Next slide. So by statute, the PCOR trust funds are dispersed according to the following formula. 80% of it goes to PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, to conduct comparative effectiveness research. 20% is allocated to the Department of Health and Human Services, of which 16% goes to AHRQ to ensure that PCOR findings are known, understood, um, and used. 4% goes to um, ASPE, the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, to support the data infrastructure needed for PCOR. Next slide. So with reauthorization, uh, the funding formula and the charge to uh, HRQ remains the same. Uh, we anticipate receiving approximately a million dollars, a hundred million dollars a year, or one billion over 10 years to support this work. And the advantage is that we don't have to spend it within any fiscal year, like the congressionally appropriated funds, but we can do some, um, the dollars can be rolled over and expended over a much longer time period which presents an opportunity for long range planning. So I want to just give you a picture of ARC's proposed strategic framework. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is the framework, um, which you can find more about on the ARC website. Um, and it will be used to guide, um, the final version will be used to guide ARC's PCOR Trust Fund investments. And we are currently in the process of gathering extensive stakeholder input. And we're doing this through se several avenues. Next slide. So we uh, posted a federal register notice requesting public input. We've, uh, the National Academy of Medicine put on four public workshops. And for discussion today, ARC's um, National Advisory Committee this body recommended the formation of a subcommittee of subject matter experts in the areas of ARC's PCOR trust fund authorizations. So our goal is to synthesize and integrate all of this external feedback and finalize our strategic plan by spring 2023. Kristen, the floor is yours. Excellent. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes, for that kind introduction. Um, and I'm really grateful to Director Valdez as well for his words this morning on rural communities, which is where I've lived and worked for most of my life, um, because I guess I like it here. Um, so it's great pleasure for me to be sharing with you all uh, the content from the four meetings that we held with a great group of experts who were convened under the auspices of your charge. Let's go to the next slide. I wanna thank the subcommittee members. Here's the first half of them here um, who brought a high level of expertise, energy and commitment to the work. Um, they displayed good humor and a willingness to respectfully disagree, which I think is one of the most important ways to get to the best thinking on an idea. I especially appreciate Murray and Mai for doing double duty um, and bringing their expertise as NAC members to our group. Next slide. Um, the members and I are also grateful to Amy Rabin and her team um, who backed up our work with flawless project management and tech support. All right, so here's the charge. Um, this is what we were asked to do. Um, the the uh, header really has a pretty large scope um, around providing input on strategic planning, management, and evaluation of ARC's PCOR trust fund investments, and then a few specific call outs. Um, the first related to um, advising, providing input on development of a connected portfolio of projects, um, including objectives, metrics, strategies. Um, second, uh, providing some input on ways the agency could innovate 
around increasing the success of dissemination and implementation activities. Um, in a related, um, the fourth item, similar innovating or in the training uh, component of what ARC is authorized to do, um, and including ensuring diversity, equity, and inclusion in uh, the next generation of researchers. And then finally, advice around uh, communication, dissemination, implementation of the evidence, a key piece of ARC's authorization um, for the PCOR Trust Fund, and especially how um, can additional stakeholders or new partners be brought in um, to increase the impact of that work. So next slide. Uh, so the subcommittee has met four times. Um, each of them were three hour virtual meetings. These are the uh, general uh, summary of the themes that we addressed at each meeting. Um, we started with that draft strategic framework uh, that you just saw in Dr. Rhodes' presentation, as well as an excellent briefing on um, ARC's current work in training um, and discussion of that area. Meeting two, we focused on health equity, DNI, and um, innovations and targeted ways to communicate uh, what we know about what works and what could make healthcare better. And then session three dove into some bigger ideas around uh, innovations in dissemination and implementation, um, had a, a really active debate around strategies for measuring success. Some of the themes you know, have come up here um, in your meeting today already. So we'll double back to those. And then finally, um, spent our final meeting taking a very careful look at the written report that you all received to ensure that um, we're correctly representing both the places where the subcommittee came to consensus on issues um, and also the places where maybe several members promoted an idea, but it maybe didn't have exactly that same traction to be a full um, consensus of the group. Uh, so I think, so we'll meet for a fifth time in January of 23 and have an opportunity to follow up on anything that comes from your discussion today. And I guess what I'd say is for all the detail that's in the report, I wanna emphasize the top line message, which is the subcommittee members were unified in their enthusiasm about the opportunity that this PCOR Trust Fund offers, both for ARC's work and for the health of the people of our country. Um, the members brought a lot of optimism about the possibilities for improving quality of healthcare, improving the experience of receiving healthcare, um, and shifting ARC and recipient organizations to uh, more pervasively integrate health equity, patient experience, and stakeholder engagement in the work. Next slide. So the first um, area that we discussed was the draft strategic framework. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, how it um, is depicted on the website and other places. Um, and this is the information that was used to solicit the public comment, um, which is being you know, received and processed through a separate channel. Um, and we did, as we were working, uh, several of those other input processes that Dr. Rhodes summarized were taking place. And so our, our group definitely uh, tried to pay attention to those, um, understand what was being said in those rooms. It's, it was not our role to fully integrate those comments or positions, uh, but we absolutely found them really valuable as jumping off points for conversation. Um, so the, the subcommittee's feedback on the framework was, does a really good job of describing the bounds of the PCOR Trust Fund potential, what could be done, um, the subcommittee felt these areas were worthwhile um, and did make the observation that a huge range of healthcare improvement work could fit in this framework, um, which led to the suggestion that perhaps a next step in this process would be to narrow this framework into some sort of a strategic agenda, decision-making tool that would help support portfolio design and the decisions, the tough decisions about what's in and what's out um, of the scope of the work that ARC's gonna support. The additional advice the subcommittee had on some modifications to consider, um, and this is really aligned with national conversations, administration's priorities, and honestly, what I've heard from you all here today. Um, one is to shift health equity to be a goal and an outcome across the priority areas. 
um, that it's an element in the ARC and the grantee processes for even the funding itself, as well as doing the work. And that it helps prompt questions like what healthcare organizations are included in ARC funded projects? And are we reaching the sites of care that are reaching the populations who experience health inequities? Or is the work in some ways compounding inequity by putting resource um, in settings that already may be more highly resourced? Um, another one would be, you know, how is advancing health equity a consideration in how grantees design their programs um, and how the grant review process works? So those are just a couple examples that came up of how health equity could um, become an area of focus that spans the portfolio. Um, and really, the message was the same around patient experience and engagement. Um, the committee um, was, was unified in pushing that this also be a theme that's um, across the portfolio, across the projects, um, and did repeatedly bring up um, the experience and the work that PCORI has done um, in the patient, in, around patient and community engagement as an example of a possible, um, possible way to model what, what, what could happen. Um, a really uh, great example came up um, in this area, just what, how could patient experience and patient engagement make things different, which is um, there's the focus on multiple chronic conditions. And I think as, as a clinician, my mindset goes to, you know, hitting the evidence-based targets for disease control and disease management. And the question came up, well, when a, when a patient has four, five, six or more chronic conditions, is their goal really an A1C of under eight? Is their goal really a blood, systolic blood pressure of 135? Or are their goals of care um, going to be something different in many cases? And does our process um, create a way that that patient priority and patient value around what's important to them in their life becomes a priority of the healthcare system as well? Uh, in addition, you know, there definitely was support for having specific areas of work um, around equity and engagement if there's places where art can adv advance the science of those areas within um, this, the PCOR Trust Fund authorization, you know, which really does focus on training and DNI as the work that ARC does with this money. Next slide. Uh, so this just uh, summarizes what I went over, um, considering great start, considering how this gets focused into a decision-making tool to create a coherent and uh, inter interrelated portfolio that has a potential to really make change um, in the healthcare system and in health, and then uh, consider health equity and patient experience engagement as overarching themes. Next slide. Uh, so around portfolio design, um, a, a, a message I really heard loud and clear is uh, many members of the committee felt like the biggest gap is not knowing what's effective in healthcare. It's it's getting what's effective in healthcare to actually be the thing that healthcare is doing, um, and just continuing to focus on that um, and and thinking about how can ARC be a piece of that disseminating implementing the. Um, the modes of care, the ways of providing care, the clinical models that we know work. Um, there was some humility expressed around the idea that this is not the first time that a federal government agency or someone else has taken a run at this. And many of those efforts have fallen short of their goals um, around care transformation. Many of them have been very successful. So what, what can happen here to really maximize the lessons and learning from what's gone before, whether, and there's um, a whole list of the different um, initiatives the committee, subcommittee looked at, as well as references um, for further review. Um, but yeah, just a whole range of different initiatives from ARC, from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, um, from CMS themselves, uh, private uh, private initiatives. Um, there's a lot's, a lot's happened in this area and uh, it's time. it's a good time to build on it. Um, bundling implementation and training together wherever possible um, so that we're learning and doing at the same time people are being trained um, in the work as ARC is helping to move it forward. Um, and then a lot of talk around um, accountability 
equity again in terms of who's partners in the projects and how does the money flow in the projects to ensure that particularly to the degree there are partners who may be less common in in the universe of folks receiving ARC funding how do we ensure that community-based organizations or freestanding clinics or patient advocates um, or uh, others who are involved in this work are compensated fairly um, and have the resource to really be full partners. Next slide. So on the thinking around um, training and partnerships and just sort of next steps, um, innovating and training, the subcommittee's message was basically, yeah, go, go, go. Um, think about uh, how can how can the training dollars help support people who are working in settings other than academic medical centers and doing work other than publishing, you know, like say health systems or quality research? Um, how can we train folks from different professional backgrounds? Um, what can be done in shorter um, shorter duration training programs, more focused training programs, mid career programs? Basically, um, the committee said just. Just go go broad in thinking about how this money can really train the, the people, the professionals we need to move the work forward. Building partnerships, again, great idea. A lot of talk about the context in which healthcare takes place and the fact that having um, a focus exclusively on sort of the clinician patient site of care dynamic um, puts a lot of pressure there without looking at the system and the context and the importance of having health system leaders, um, state policymakers, federal policymakers, payers, whether that's commercial insurance or public programs, all on the same page and aligned. So they're creating a context where this change is really um, supported and doesn't involve us asking part of the system to swim upstream while the other parts of the system keep doing things the way they have been. Um, and then finally, um, the subcommittee, um, it's certainly been just a great joy to work with the group. Um, I think we've um, really enjoyed what we've been able to do together. And we are very open um, to continuing uh, an, additional, an additional term of work if there's additional ways um, that we can be helpful in advising, um, helping frame up uh, what, what happens with the trust fund. All right, next slide. All right, so this is this is the final slide looking at the recommendations. And these are sort of these are sort of the big three where there was a lot of energy, a lot of discussion, some disagreement. Um, and I just really want to flag for you um, that these may be places where you also um, can help uh, in thinking about uh, in your in your conversations today and in the future. Um, so the first thinking about innovating in the DNI portfolio. You know, I think we've heard a little bit about, for instance, some of ARC's excellent work that either wasn't recognized as being ARC's work as it's put into use or hasn't had the uptake um, we really would have liked um, by, um, by healthcare providers and the health system in general. Um, and so continuing to think about that really broad engagement about what evidence gets prioritized for implementation. So we're taking patients and taking care providers and taking health systems, the changes that they're really looking for um, to, to meet their goals. And then the other would be to consider um, a DNI structure that can provide continuity across the multiple projects of ARCs. There may be some real benefit from creating continuity over time across you know, multiple types of initiative, multiple areas of initiation um, in really building some staying power. Um, in the DNI work that ARC is doing, and also in the partnerships um, that are that are being um, proposed and supported, you know, and that I'm even hearing from you. Uh, the second one around evaluation, you all have already touched on this. Um, it's just the idea that uh, creating change takes resource and time and energy of all types, and doing evaluation and and researching what's happened, evaluating the change also takes resource and time and energy, and those two can compete with each other. And so thinking about what's the right size on the evaluation work so that um, ARC, ARC and others have the feedback that's needed on what happened, was this successful? 
but also being cautious to not get so focused on um, particularly patient level or population level evaluation of change that it pulls away from the implementation work itself. We don't have an answer here. The group could not come to a consensus, but it was definitely flagged as an area that merits um, careful consideration. And then the final um, place where the conversation came back a number of times um, was really sort of to the side of the key charge we were asked, but the committee really felt strongly that they needed to flag some barriers in the larger healthcare context that could um, that could really get in the way of what ARC is looking to do. Um, one was the struggles around maintaining and establishing comprehensive primary care services, because it was primary care where the conversation returned to many, many times. Um, but many of those best models that have been developed for primary care are actually misaligned with the payment systems and the staffing models and the other pieces that would actually make them happen. That's not specifically an ARCS authorization with the PCOR Trust Fund, but the committee just, the subcommittee just really wanted to encourage ARC to partner with other federal agencies, with states, um, with private entities um, to address that wherever possible. Because um, you know, if the settings of care aren't, aren't able to implement and sustain these models, even if we know they work, um, it's really going to get in the way of what could have been achieved with this trust fund money. And then the other two, a similar reason, but it was the workforce issues. With regard to workforce, the concerns expressed were around burnout in the existing workforce, shortages, pervasive openings in positions in health systems, and then the need for pathways to develop some of the novel workforce that we think could really help move care forward. Um, and the discussion there was around uh, peer, peer support specialists in addiction care, uh, community health workers and similar. And finally, the payment and finance issues, um, thinking about the um, uh, issues around, uh, yeah, just having the payment and finance, finance models align with what we wanna do. Not core to ARC's authorization, but these if these are enough out of alignment with what ARC is trying to do, they could really get in the way. Last slide. So uh, here's some proposed questions for your discussion today. Um, we will meet again in January, as I mentioned, um, to revisit any questions you have for us. Um, and yeah, uh, for this session, I look forward to answering any questions that you have about our work um, and look forward to bringing back um, any, any further requests you have of the subcommittee to our future meeting um, and just seeing what we can do to help support this great opportunity that's offered by the PCOR Trust Fund. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take it. Okay, so um, th thanks uh, to to you both uh, for this uh, for the summary and and um, and now we we do have our questions lined up here. Uh, just just like the last uh, discussion, we'll we'll take comments from the from the group. I'll run I'll run through the questions really quickly though, um, as we as we line up to uh, to respond to to these questions and or other comments you want to provide for the for the team around this um, this snack so one other additional ways beyond what the subcommittee has already suggested to advance health equity patient experience and community engagement second what might be achieved by an implementation initiative with broad geographic scope and a long timeline and what are the design features of that kind of um, that type of initiative uh, there's a question around evaluation strategies that focus on implementation science, science approaches versus population health outcomes, so process versus outcomes in some ways. Uh, what's the role that ARC plays in or could play in addressing the barriers to success that the SNAC identified? And what are some of those partnerships uh, that, um, that Dr. Dillon uh, talked about that we should um, consider? And then uh, what questions do we want the SNAC to address in January? Keeping in mind, folks, that, um, you know, we charge the SNAC, right? That's, it's, that's, our, that's our group. So we really do have an opportunity here to point them in the right direction to answer the questions that we think are most critical um, to, move, to move things forward. So with those questions in mind and with that opportunity in mind, let's, uh, let's start taking uh, some, uh, 
some comments here. Uh, Neil, I saw you first. Thank you and great, great job. Uh, Kristen and Karen, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, as a representative of the business community, I was really struck by the fact that there was no mention of the business community in the recommendations. And it's frustrating to me because employers are funding PCORI uh, through an ACA imposed tax. Uh, and employers are not seeing a lot of value so far for their spending in terms of PCORI research that is relevant to them and their populations. So I'd encourage uh, the snack in your January meeting to think about how to make it a little more explicit, even in your list of stakeholders. Uh, employers are not payers, they're purchasers. Uh, and so we ought to call them out uh, in that manner. Um, but just to give you a couple of things to ruminate on in terms of what's ARC's role here in, in your charge, in getting employees a little more engaged. Uh, uh, thinking about uh, the um, dissemination and implementation arm, you know, thinking a little more broadly about how can employers uh, implement with your assistance or advice uh, benefit design changes or well being program changes that take into account PCOR findings, uh, PCORI findings. Uh, another example on the training side is thinking about how can we get create more academic business partnerships for research? And this has been, you know, as somebody who comes from the research world, but then started a business coalition, there's not a lot of great research taking place in the business community. And there aren't that many academic business partnerships. So really think about how can ARC foster more of that so that we don't just have a lot of research in Medicaid and Medicare that sort of gets extrapolated to the business community, but are actually doing meaningful research in the business community. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Um, and, and really that um, really interesting um, potential synergy between the role of, um, of business and the misalignments that were noted in comprehensive primary care, and, and can can business actually do something about that? Um, given that they are purchasers, as you as you mentioned, I also wanted to um, call on Murray because um, you know one of our NAC members is on the snack. So um, I'm going to, um, even though I don't know that you raised your hand, I'm going to call you out anyway, Murray. If you if you can just kind of um, jump in here and, and comment on uh, your thoughts in terms of actually being engaged in these conversations. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, first, I just want to say, uh, Kristen and Karen did an amazing job. Uh, this was a kind of huge task in some way to think about um, uh, these goals and how to help um, our kind of achieve them. Um, and so I honestly, I, I would rather turn it back and hear from the NAC um, about their comments uh, so that we can be even more productive on this front. That's that's fair. Thank you. Uh, Jaji, you're up. Great. Uh, first, thank you for the great presentation and also all the recommendations. Uh, my comment is on the question number four, on whether evaluation strategy should be focused on implementation science or population health outcomes. Uh, in on my opinion, basically, they are two different phases of a learning health system. You start with data collection, you analyze the data, have some intervention strategies, then do the implementation, then get the data from the practice, coming back again to analyze. So basically you should do all of this for the entire cycle for all of the learning health system, which can be a small clinic, could be a community, or even a state or entire nation. So I think the focus should be on all of this. Thanks, Shaji. Um, Saf. Thanks so much. Um, you, my my for, uh, three three quick comments. My first is uh, wild agreement with with Jaji's comment. Uh, the implementation population health is is maybe a false dichotomy, and and I think we can perhaps focus um, on the question of uh, funding through this mechanism. Arc funding through this mechanism, the kind of transformative. Um, take a big bet uh, type of research with the big partnerships 
that might give us a sense of what are the follow through innovations that are going to help transform healthcare. Uh, ARC, NIH, other federal funding mechanisms already exist to find the atomized A versus A plus B, the breakthrough innovations, the basic sciences, both in basic clinical and biological sciences, but also the basic sciences of health services research. This mechanism could, if I may be so bold to, to suggest, offer the opportunity and have the bar set to take the big long-term bets on those big strategic priorities that you've laid out. Don't be afraid of failure. The only failure you would have is if you failed to learn. And I do not worry about ARC grantees and ARC failing to learn. Disseminate, maybe that's a challenge, but you will learn. The bigger risk of failure, in my mind, is to take the usual route. And here I'm gonna be a little controversial and uh, I might come from institutions where you would think I'm crazy to say this. I think that the bar to fund the usual suspects in this work should be extraordinarily high. Who are the usual suspects? I'll name them. The traditional academic medical centers, the traditional health services researchers who get gobs and gobs of funding from ARC and other institutions who are fantastic. They, it's not that they shouldn't, they can compete, of course, it's an open marketplace, but the bar should be, are you bringing your best set of partnerships, your widest set of purchasers and community-based organizations and new coalitions and rural coalitions to the table? Or is it the same fill in the blank folks that are gonna give you the A versus A plus B published in New England Journal and never get it implemented anywhere else? This trust fund, and dissemination charge offers you the opportunity to do and think differently. And I would go for it. And, and I would go for it in safety. I would go for it in equity. I would go for it in comprehensive primary care. And that's the last comment, which is, this is the world I come from. There are huge issues and huge sort of payer finance dynamics. The opportunity here might be to learn from the existing and upcoming big tests across states and federal partnerships to really ask questions that are almost impossible to ask in the sort of basic health services research world, which is what is the kind of playbook that a practice might need in a multi-payer and multi-stakeholder way within a health system or ACO to try to transform itself to prospective equity-focused comprehensive primary care. There are like tons and tons, and there are many wonderful ARC resources that take shards of that playbook. But what's a comprehensive playbook building on something like evidence now and saying that's for ABCs? Now, what are the ABCs of modern advanced primary care? It's a big bet. That's hard stuff. That's big money. But what else are we going to focus on? The days of pilots and little atomized studies to build academic careers, not for this funding mechanism, in my humble opinion. I, I think that was provocative, um, but, <laughs> um, but I think also, also well said, take big bets um, and, and really think about the partnerships, who's at the table um, and, and, and really push the envelope on what that, what that could look like. Um, I think that's, I think that's a good point. Jiangling, you're up next. Thank you, Romano. And I would just want to uh, uh, comment, a uh, little emphasize the recommendation or the question on whether what the ARC should focus on the evaluation strategy and you know the uh, implementation science approaches versus population health outcome. I think in healthcare outcome is extremely important in particularly when it's come to patients and families and they want to know whether that would help them when you implement a science approach. So I think there is a space to do both. You know, the evaluate implementation, scientific approach, you can like a process measure or a process evaluation. And that process, how effective to get you to improve the public, population health outcome. So I think there's room to do both rather than whether we do this not do that or do that and not do this. So I think we could do it. And the, the second point I want to make, make it is that, uh, you know, we talk about everything is patient-centered. We want to include stakeholders like a patient family. But I noticed that 
on the snack, you, you all did a great job, a fantastic recommendation. That is, it's a tough job, but I think you did wonderful. But I noticed that there's no uh, stakeholders from patients rep. rep. And you, you talk about to building a future partnership uh, with the communities and then including patient organization like that. I think it's, this is a very critical for them because the healthcare focuses on them. So if SNAC is charted to move forward uh, with more meetings and more tasks, I would recommend maybe you would think about to including a patient wrap from organizations to hear what they think that your strategy focus should focus on also from their perspective. So thank you. That's a great call out. Um, and, and we do have, have, again, an opportunity to think about if we decide to re-up the snack for another, another term, we do have an opportunity to think about the membership um, representation and um, you know what who, what folks we want at the table that that is on that is on the table for for that discussion. Come on, you're next. Thank you, Edmondo, and thank you to Dr. Dillon and, and Dr. Rhodes uh, for this discussion. Um, one zoomed in comment, which is uh, related specifically to the training programs and developing the pipeline. I think that's a wonderful effort, and I'm glad that the snack uh, was very favorable and sort of. Um, uh, advocating for that. I would encourage um, us to think about training programs that really reach all kinds of people uh, who are involved in care and perhaps even think of cohorts that are interprofessional in and of themselves because there's rich discussion when there are multiple perspectives in one room rather than a training co uh, program for type of A people, type of B people, type of C people. Um, and then a zoomed out comment, you know, um, recognizing that these funds from the trust um, go to different groups, ASPE, PCORI, and AHRQ. Um, I was wondering if um, at some point there would be either a, a figure or some sort of discussion about, you know, where are the synergies and where are the differences? Because I'm imagining the same conversations that the SNAC is having that other groups within those various um, other two organizations are having. And so where are those synergies? And how, how can people who, who aren't intimately aware of this work understand what those are. Thank you. Yeah, some good good points. Dr. Rose, did you want to comment on that at all? Or you're, you're just keep not so much. Okay. Um, Caroline. Thank you for the terrific work done and um, enlightening us on the activities that you've engaged in with the snack. It's really interesting. I have comments that won't surprise anyone um, given the hats that I've worn that I would bring up yet again, which is encouraging you to look at payer partnerships with the funding. Uh, as a payer, I have a very skinny down budget. I don't have a research staff who have the type of skills or talents needed to really study some of the outcomes I could get at sitting on the data that I sit at and uh, sit upon. And so being able to bring those together would be terrific. Uh, I would encourage you to think about opening up those mechanisms for a payer to be the lead uh, in engaging with research and with uh, care delivery systems. I think it would be an interesting twist on how funding is usually granted through the university first. I'm in huge agreement with Asif's comments uh, about making this even bigger uh, than the single researcher in a single academic institution and perhaps looking at, at the state level or a geographic level, a MSA or um, that type of level, what's happening in the health systems there in terms of access, availability, and outcomes of care. The second comment that I would make is moving now beyond what is been traditional healthcare setting into those non-traditional settings of care that equity is funding largely. Um, Walgreens and CVS-based clinics, uh, Walgreens Village MD, you know, expanding everywhere. What's happening in the influence of Google and Amazon and their moves into healthcare? Um, where do we see the importance of the PBM industry uh, and the ability to get Medicaid 
patients, how does that influence our primary care outcomes? How does that all look more as a system of care um, more broadly into these newer models? Uh, so I really appreciate your taking these points into consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, thank you for this um, for these great recommendations and the opportunity to comment. I, I completely agree with the idea of, um, of raising the bar for funding and, and thinking differently about how, uh, how funds and resources are allocated. And I love the idea of uh, payer multidisciplinary interdisciplinary partnerships around an implementation framework of some kind. Um, so I completely support the idea that uh, if we concentrate on implementing what we already know is good evidence, the patient outcomes, as someone also said, will follow and we should measure those too. But, uh, but we need to figure out why um, and measure and report what happens when we try to do widespread implementation. And, and what we can do to um, mitigate the, the barriers um, where they exist across the board. So we've got, we have to, we have to look, um, look big and broad in order to tease those things out, I think. Um, it, it, where we should concentrate, I, I think I spoke earlier about the tremendous amount of care variation we have. And so I would think about, how, uh, how we might concentrate on where we have evidence um, that we know, but where in the real world setting, there's tremendous care variation. And I would start there because I think that allows some um, opportunities for widespread change. Um, another idea would be widespread <clears throat> evaluation across geographic settings of primary care teams. And that, that I think would fit well with the idea of interdisciplinary partnerships, but also interdisciplinary teams and being able to tease out the, the differences among those. And, and where, where we can do that, then we should also measure fiscal outcomes. Uh, and the, so the cost of the team and the cost saved by the team uh, whenever and wherever we can. So thank you. Thanks, Kathy. I want to I want to push before I go to my, the next person up. I want to push on one point. I think Asaf, you might have you might have started it, but I heard from Caroline and Kathy also seconded, which is okay. So if we are looking to expand the potential, uh, um, let's call it phenotype of the person that would receive these uh, the of the entities that would receive these funds uh, to move this uh, these concepts forward, one of the one of the challenges. And you brought this up, Caroline. What might be that they uh, they don't have the research track record, maybe not the research training, and and, and all, all of these all of these things, right? You just said you know you don't have the resources to have a um, you know robust uh, research teams that an academic um, institution, university based, uh, might have. So how do you address that? You know, the, even even just the the, the grantsmanship itself might not be the same if you, as you start to open up, you know, your stakeholder um, group. Um, thoughts on how you would address that, that issue as you start to think about, you know, operationalizing the concept. You might start with a training program mm. um, that might, uh, and, and, you know, that has elements of grantsmanship within it too, right? But you might think about how you might expand training and expertise that includes grantsmanship, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, that might uh, that might prepare and give the competencies to underrepresented groups in mm -hmm. terms of funding. Mm -hmm. off. Yeah. Uh, you might also uh, highlight and start with the composition of the study sections and the committees that are chosen to select the grants and make sure that they adequately represent the bride's broad mm. swath of um, entities. I mean, I think that we have a bit of a narrow view sometimes about who has sufficient research capacities. Um, I think there is vast capacity within state and local um, public health officials, within parts of QIO networks, within parts of 
payer and purchaser networks where that, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's different to sort of think, you know, could, could, I don't even know statutorily if ARC could like fund a local health department to staff up, you know, and evaluate and, you know, a sort of quasi experimental design of a broad implementation in some rural health parameter. But if it's possible, then I would, you know, suggest that that in combination with the right partnerships, you know, right broad swath, it's not like exclude academia, it's just don't start with academia and have the composition of the study section be mostly full professors at X, Y, and Z universities, you know, have it broadly represent and, and then determine the capacities of the grants for forward. Great points. I want to pull uh, David Schmitz in because uh, I got, got a comment in here and I want to um, pull him in. I know it's sometimes hard when you're on Zoom. I was just going to be uh, suggesting that the use of practice-based research networks might be a creative way to have an entity which uh, has experienced uh, project management and could receive grants as an awardee, uh, but also really integrate into communities that otherwise might be underrepresented. So PBRNs are growing, for example, in some institutions being more inclusive of, of tribal entities, et cetera. And so there could be a particular interest in looking at rural and underserved communities through a use of a PBRN network. Thanks, David. And uh, I'm kind of going to pull you back in since I since I posed the question. Before. Thanks. Uh, I, as a young researcher, I got started in that field of my uh, that part of my career with an NIMH funded fellowship. And I would love to see ARC consider an ARC funded type of fellowship, particularly to look at this area that would then require as part of that fellowship, a partnership with a, a payer, for instance, we fund fellowships for managed care pharmacists for you know other kinds of roles, and I think this would be a terrific opportunity to open up the field to developing researchers. Uh, that's great. Going back to the training that, that Kathy uh, mentioned, Patrick, you're up. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I think this is a fantastic report um, with an excellent set of recommendations. So I think everything that we say here in this committee um, should be viewed as, as just trying to fill the holes or maybe little gaps or expand certain things. But I think the basic structure of, of what you've outlined is brilliant. Um, and uh, in, in terms of strategic framework, I strongly support health equity, patient community engagement being more front and center as overarching principles. But I'd like to build on previous comments from Neil, Caroline, and Yan Ling. Um, as the stack moves forward, uh, I think we should consider expanding the stack, perhaps bringing in a greater diversity of perspectives to enhance its work. And I say so particularly with attention to the changes that Congress made in the authorization language for the PCOR Trust Fund. And I was surprised to see, maybe it's a timing issue, that those changes weren't specifically addressed in a stack report. So I pulled up, because I'm a little bit of a policy geek, so I pulled up Public Law 116.94, and I see that um, Congress specifically asked um, for the priorities of the PCOR Trust Fund to be expanded to include research with respect to intellectual and developmental disabilities and maternal mortality. And furthermore, the addition of economic outcomes, I think is really important um, because this was a key gap, a key hole in what um, PCORI and ARC were allowed to do with the PCOR Trust Fund resources. And so the law specifically now calls out that clinical and patient-centered outcomes shall include potential burdens and economic impacts of the utilization of medical treatments and services on different stakeholders and decision makers, including out-of-pocket costs, health plan benefit, formulary design, non-medical costs, caregiving, future costs of care, workplace productivity, and absenteeism and healthcare utilization. So I think there's a real opportunity here that maybe you didn't jump on well enough um, to expand what you do and to really bring value um, into the discussion. Because as we heard this morning, this is now a $4 trillion industry, 19% of the GDP, no signs of contraction. Uh, and 
we need to bring value into the discussion along with outcomes, safety, and patient-centeredness. Thanks, thanks, Patrick. Uh, David Myers actually did note, um, uh, since maybe we have more than one policy geek um, uh, in, on the call, uh, that those those changes on the, from the reauthorization language apply to PCORI, um, and, and ARC's language as a component of the trust fund uh, was not changed. Um, so great. So one of the one of the you know one of our tasks as as the NAC um, when we have a snack is to is to again provide a charge um, and 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 although it, I don't know that it's happened before even consider um, reauthorizing that snack um, for another another year we'll have more time to discuss the snack at our next meeting um, but one thing that we can do is provide some insights into what they should discuss at that January meeting that Dr. Dillon mentioned. So um, just think about things that you would specifically want that the SNAC to discuss in January um, that we would add to what we already, we've already learned from, from their discussions up to date um, so, that, so that we can include that in our discussion in our next NAC meeting, um, uh, which will also consider next steps. Um, based on those uh, these recommendations, um, I think that's it on my list. So, what's next up? Okay, so. Uh, with that discussion, uh, with that robust discussion, and thank thank you all. There, the snack did provide recommendations, uh, and it's our role to accept or not accept those recommendations. Uh, again, we know that the snack is still ongoing, and there's there's further conversations. But uh, you guys did have a chance to review the recommendations that they provided to date. So. Uh, um, I'm going to call the question of acceptance of the recommendations from the Pecori Trust Fund Subcommittee of the National Advisory Council. So do I have a motion to approve those recommendations? So moved by Kathy, second. And seconded. All those in favor of approving those recommendations? Hands raised. Any folks opposed? All right, that motion carries. We have approved the recommendations of the snack. Um, we're a couple minutes early, so we can see if they're ready for um, public comment. They're oh, they're on. Okay, so we're we're um, we can roll right into public comment. Uh, then thanks for uh, thanks to, to Shannon uh, Davila for being on um, and ready for a comment. So Shannon Davila from uh, ECRI, uh, you're up. Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yep. Very good. Good afternoon. My name is Shannon Devella, and I'm the Director of Safety at ECRI and the Institute for Safe Medication Practices Patient Safety Organization. I'm also the co-chair of the Alliance for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety, the um, AQIPS, which is the professional organization for PSOs and their providers. Um, I'm the co-chair of that National Safe Table Committee, and thank you to the council for allowing me to speak today. I'm excited to be with you all today to update you on our PSO National Safe Table Program, where we bring together PSO workforce, healthcare providers, patient representatives, researchers, government officials to improve the delivery of patient care. I was here about a year ago where I introduced the program to you all, so it's, it's really um, exciting to be back today. Um, so a little background to those of you that don't remember, the National Safe Table Program kicked off in January of 2021. And PSOs have been conducting safe tables for the past decade as a primary mode of raising awareness of healthcare professional concerning issues that keep us up at night, um, many of which you all probably talked about today. Conducting analysis and del deliberations in a protected environment and distributing clinical solutions and protocols to help improve outcomes and the culture of safety. So I wanted to share some of our latest national safe table activities. To date, we have hosted seven national level safe tables that have reached hundreds of healthcare providers through the discussion and distribution of best practices and feedback for the benefit of our patients. Um, in September of 2021, the Academic Medical Center hosted the first national safe table for PSOs on the topic of detecting and reporting patient safety risks associated with virtual care delivery 
and over 30 of the PSOs around the country participated in that. In January of this year, HPI Prescani PSO hosted the second safe table on the topic of understanding and preventing diagnostic error in the ambulatory care setting. And this event was attended by over 260 participants, including a number of our um, collaborating PSOs. Uh, in March at the uh, PSES Summit, we had two safe tables. We had the causal analysis safe table, which was led by the Just Culture Company, and then the Nebraska Coalition for Patient Safety PSO and the University of Nebraska collaborated on a Capturing Falls safe table. Now, just last week, my organization, ECRI and the ISMP, hosted the national safe table for post-acute care providers on the topic of antibiotic stewardship. And we featured speakers from both CDC and the ARC-funded Nursing Home Collaborative. And this event was attended by close to 200 participants. And um, later this month, again, the Academic Medical Center PSO is going to be um, conducting another safe table on the best practices of OR fire safety. So next year, we have four national safe tables scheduled in the first and second quarter alone, including lessons learned from maternal health safe tables, how to conduct a joint root cause analysis, um, and equity and bias in patient care. So in summary, we are committed to the National Safe Table Program to be a critical element of healthcare learning system as part of the National Action Plan for Patient Safety. Thank you again for the opportunity to make these comments. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have and happy Thanksgiving to all of you next week. Thank you, Shannon. Um, seeing that there are no other public comments, we're gonna go right into chair's wrap up. So, um, I love having the privilege of just deciding what we're going to do for the next like fifteen minutes. And I do it on the fly. I don't. I don't. I don't pre-set what we're going to do. So um, I'll do a couple things here. Um, so one, thank you all for a really engaging meeting. Um, there were some very meaty topics um, and you uh, and folks really leaned in and and uh, gave I think really really good recommendations a lot of them um, so you know the the team um, here at ARC will have to you know kind of figure out how to prioritize but I thought it was a really rich really rich conversation a couple takeaways that I just wanted to share um, maybe they're maybe they're kind of high level but I'm going to share them anyway so one is uh, Take big bets. I think that's what I heard. Um, sure, that can apply to uh, to funding where you've got a you know a you know billion dollars over ten years, but then maybe that applies even more broadly. Um, another thing I, I think I heard was um, expand your view of who your stakeholders are, and then incorporate them into your work in multiple different ways. Right. Um, another, another area that I was, you know, again, really excited about is let's, let's re-engage around patient safety and think about who, again, back to the stakeholders, who are those stakeholders in the, in those conversations and bring them to the table. Um, last but not least, think this, the idea of really baking equity into everything that we're doing. Um, so those those are those are some of the takeaways I had from um, from our, our time together uh, so far. One thing I I do want to do um, I, I again I, I called an audible and flipped the, the agenda around a little bit um, on the NAC members where this is their last meeting. So I I did call you out quickly, but I did warn you that I was going to come back to you. Um, so and if you're if you're, this is your last meeting and you're on Zoom, you are not exempt from me calling you out, just, just so you know. So thanks, Susan, for jumping on video because you knew I was coming to you at some point. Um, so um, one, I just want to thank you all. Um, I've um, been able to engage with each of you over, the, over your time on, on the NAC. Um, again, very, very um, astute insights from quite frankly, really different perspectives that I think is really valuable and rich in these discussions. Um, as, as the art team has noted, um, you don't leave the NAC and then just like disappear from art. You 
you get, keep getting pulled back in. So you might as well just expect it and, and anticipate it because that's what's going to happen. Um, and um, you really do have kind of these the lifelong friends um, here at Mac. But I really want to thank you all for for your engagement over your over your term of service as part of the NAC. I will um, again take chair's privilege to go through each departing member and give you an opportunity to um, give them um, some some you know parting comments. Let's say uh, I'm going to go in alphabetical order, not by Zoom. So I'm just going to call you all in alphabetical order which this is probably not the first time, but it's off your first. <laughs> um, well, well, thanks to you, Edmondo. Thanks to um, you, Dr. Valdez, to Dr. Rhodes, to the entire um, NAC committee and the entire infrastructure behind the NAC. Um, thank you for... Uh, I can't even imagine how much it takes to sort of put this all together. So I want to appreciate that because um, one of the things I have loved about being on the NAC is that um, there are a lot of um, uh, governmental and multi-stakeholder groups that talk a big game about um, uh, really stakeholder engagement, but I think you all do it really, really, really well. Jamie, I, I think, you know, in particular call your work out. Um, it's really hard to do this, to keep apprised of FACA rules and all the things that you guys perfectly sort of um, engage around to have the right hard conversations about the big topics. And Dr. Valdez, I, I, I think that you said it a couple of meetings ago, you know, ARC exists to really look at how we can improve and, and continually elevate the way that the entire healthcare system, public health system functions for the entire country, which means everyone in the country. And that's a huge charge for a relatively small agency, but I think that I leave the neck excited. And, and um, I, I don't know why, but the words that came to my mind were more uh, like kind of Winston Churchill, you know, this isn't the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It's the end of the beginning. And, and it's the end of the beginning of, I think, a, an important shift in what I'm seeing that is building upon yesterday's foundations, but um, it's really uh, elevating the work across arc, the dissemination of that work, its applicability to the urgent need to change and improve the U.S. healthcare system. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think Melinda's on. Okay, she had to run. Okay, she's on the plane. Well, Susan, you're up. Well, um, as usual, I just say I have to agree with everything Asaf just said. Um, and underscore it. Um, I think that from my perspective, um, as someone who's had funding for Mark since 1995, I cannot believe how much I've learned about the agency as a member of the NAC and about many, many things that I was not aware of, not familiar of. And one thing you can totally sign me up for is being on the ARC marketing team. Um, because I think in some respects, we hide a lot of the incredible work, as we say in the South, we hide our successes, um, our light under a bushel basket. And I think that has to stop because I think ARC has much more impact and potential for impact given its size than people recognize. And that's something I'm very, very committed to continuing to support and enhance. I also am incredibly excited about the sort of renewed and enhanced focus on how ARC can really help support healthcare system improvement. It'd be really nice if we weren't the last of the high income countries on all the OECD measures. Um, I find that appalling. And so I am also very committed to helping it with anything in that realm. And then obviously um, the ongoing work around measuring and improving the patient's experience of care and patient engagement. Um, the staff have been unbelievably supportive, informative, and helpful. The one thing I won't miss is all those financial forms. Um, but even there, everyone was amazing in helping us sort through the paperwork. 
So um, thanks to all. And um, I definitely do not plan to be a stranger. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I think Omar had to drop in. Um, Mai wasn't able to make it, although Mai's still on the snack. So we'll, uh, we'll re-engage her. Um, Patrick. Well, one of the advantages of having a later letter is that uh, I have very little to add to what my colleagues have said, but it has been an incredible honor and a privilege um, to serve on this committee and um, with, this, with this group. Uh, as I, I um, started working with AHRQ uh, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I, I saw several of my mentors and advisors were members of this committee. Um, and it is just such a privilege to be able to follow in their footsteps and to participate in this process um, 20 years later. Um, I, I will just say that I think this is a very exciting time for AHRQ um, and uh, with the reauthorization of the PCOR Trust Fund, with the agency-wide, really government-wide from the White House, um, focus on uh, improving equity in healthcare, uh, improving safety. Uh, this is an exciting time um, to be at AHRQ, to be in HHS. Uh, and I really applaud Dr. Valdez for jumping into the fray and uh, taking leadership on some of these issues because uh, I think ARC is very well positioned to contribute to important discussions across the federal government and with all of the stakeholders. So such a privilege to be part of this and I commend uh, you and your team uh, to the task ahead. Thank you. Outstanding, Patrick, thank you. Uh, Yang Ling. Oh, thank you. Uh, am I the last one? <laughs> but anyway, I thank you for you know um, the opportunity. I don't know how to really start. I um, it, it is a really a privilege, an honor to join the team to work with you all. And I learned a lot about the agency, and from all uh, you know every staff and leadership at the uh, you know ARC and the uh, SNAC committee members. You know, healthcare is so complicated uh, in, in the way that, uh, you know, we have to really figure out how to improve the patient safety and quality and to, improve, to involve everyone at the table. So I constantly hear this discussion about to bring patients and families to the table the discussion and I really appreciate that. And I definitely will not go away. I know there is a big initiative now, you know, the ARC is leading uh, about, you know, regenerate the, uh, the, uh, the work, advance the work in patient safety. So I want to be part of it. And then I will also be standing by and if there's anything that I can continue to contribute to advance ARC's uh, mission and goal, I'll be happy to assist. So just call me up, <laughs> just let me know. So I'll be ready to help. And also, once again, I want to thank you all to give me the, this uh, great opportunity to serve as a NEC member and to learn from you all. So thank you. Thank you, Youngling. Um, I, I, at this point, um, I wanted to open it up for any final comments uh, from any of the NAC members. Uh, you know, I, I gave you all my my themes that I was capturing uh, through the day. Uh, if you have any other themes or comments you want to add, any haikus you want to share, um, or any <laughs> any, uh, I'm sure she has them. Yes. <laughs> Um, or any other topics for uh, any topics for future meetings, please um, jump on and we'll um, we've got a couple minutes here to to um, jump in there. Hey, Muno, I'm going to take, take the prerogative to jump in and to thank everybody for this meeting. Uh, believe it or not, I have to run to another meeting where I'm expected to to present on your favorite topic, rural health care. And um, so I, I really appreciated your your recommendations, your observations, and your suggestions. 
um, and we will take them to heart, as you know uh, that I do. And um, that means everybody around me is going to have a lot of work, <laughs> including myself. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I look forward to seeing you in our next meeting. Thank you, Dr. Valdez. Anyone else? And Mondo, I'll just add one thing. Just okay. thanks, thanks to everybody for all of your service. Um, obviously, especially for folks rotating off, we know this was during a pandemic when when you've gotten to know most of us. And and I still think we've established some some great relationships amongst the NAC, and then and obviously getting some strategic advice from you. And I'll say the door is always open and you've learned a lot this way, but if there are ways that we can improve um, or ways that you think we can help disseminate our work that we're not already doing in, in that you, you're learning so much, how can we do that better? We, we want to know. So please reach out to, to me and others at ARC. Thank you. Awesome. So I, I'd also like to thank Dr. Valdez, who just, uh, just had to run, um, and Aaron uh, Grace for their presentations, Dr. Rhodes and uh, Dylan for their presentations, the staff for pulling this all together. Um, and again, a, a last uh, thank you for the NAC members who are rotating off. The next NAC meeting is March 6th, 2023. I got the date right, right? Is it six? Yeah. Okay, I got it right, okay, yeah. Yes, uh, March 6th, 2023. Um, uh, as of right now, it's still planned to be an in-person um, meeting. Uh, and that concludes our business. Do I hear a motion to adjourn in a second? All those in favor. Hi, we are adjourned. Thank you all.